the November commission meeting is now, November 2019 commission meeting is now in session. Will you please take the roll? Commissioner Kern. <coughs> Here. Commissioner Floyd. Here. Commissioner Harper. Here. Commissioner Miletus. Here. Commissioner Pasek. Here. Commissioner Laval. Here. Chair Rosenbaum. Here. Okay, our first order of business is retail services. The distinguished gentleman will start, Brian. Good morning, Chair Rosenbaum, Commissioners. For the record, Brian Fleming, Director of Retail Services. Uh, here today for the Hillsboro 1096 appointment. Uh, staffs met with candidates. I'm going to bring four forward before you today. Uh, and with that, uh, this is about a $4.9 million store currently. Uh, lives in the city of Hillsboro, which, as you know, we've added a couple stores uh, as a result of expansion. So with that, we're going to go in alphabetic order. And I will bring up Robert Boland. Uh, we're going to have two presentations today via PowerPoint and then two presentations uh, in a hard copy format. This is Robert. And all applicants, please remember to state your name for the record. Good morning. Chair Rosenbaum. Good morning. Good morning. Commissioner. Thank you. Brian, what kind of time frame would you like for me to time them on? Uh, <laughs> Commissioner Revol, uh, your standard practice, if you will, five to seven minutes. I'll be generous today. <laughs> seven. <laughs> no, I know this one. Okay. Next. Seven. 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 Yeah. So everyone, you're aware that um, I was given this responsibility by Commissioner Pamela Weatherspoon, which I show cherish. And at one minute, I'll say one minute. And then you'll hear my little thing go off after that. So, and I'll start it after you say who you are. <laughs> okay. Good morning. My name is Robert William Boland III. And first off, I'd like to thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present my plan for Store 1096. First, I'll start by saying um, I've got a beautiful wife and three lovely children. My daughter, Ashley, just recently graduated college. She's the first one in our family to have ever graduated college. So very proud of her and two boys that attend Oregon City High School. I'll start with my retail qualifications on page three. 29 years with Safeway, started out in my local neighborhood Martin Luther King Safeway store and worked my way up to store director. I was a store director for five years uh, at Safeway, overseeing stores of about 140 employees and doing about $540,000 worth of sales. I led my district in cash handling, so we made sure all of our employees handled cash correctly, uh, ensured all company policies, procedures, and state laws were followed. And we also were part of the Responsible Vendor pr Training Program. So we trained our cashiers to make sure that we were a responsible vendor. As a district manager, overseeing 26 stores in the Portland metro area, part of those stores being the Hillsboro Market, so I'm very familiar with that market, led the Portland division for nine consecutive quarters of customer service with Safeway, improved underperforming stores, and exceeded sales. On the next page, I did a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats of store 1096. Some of the strengths right now, they've got a brand new beer cooler. It's added more traffic to the store. Pretty knowledgeable staff on all of my visits. Third fastest growing city in the Portland metro, in the metro area, and sixth in the state. So definitely some strengths for that business. Some weaknesses, declining sales. You mentioned that there was two new agents uh, in the area that's hurt this store sales. And the exterior needs some updating. Some opportunities that I noticed Merchandising in the front of the store, the back of the store looks really well merchandised, but the front of the store, I think I can add some value there. Cross merchandise, again, cross merchandising to get additional traffic. Some of the threats to this store, uh, the neighborhood stores, obviously, is going to be competition. And then Bruce, the current agent, has done a great job building relationships with the local uh, licensees and the employees. Bruce and his wife, Gail, also own the liquor store out in Forest Grove, and so I anticipate a little bit of um, employees leaving to go to the Forest Grove store too. He also mentioned that. On the next slide, if you look at the current uh, picture of the front of the store that I was talking about around the checkout, and then the proposed look of where I'm going with it, more modern, clean look, some reclaimed wood, and, um, and just an overall cleaner atmosphere in the front. If you turn to the next slide, I'm a very simple person. I'd love to run a clean, <coughs> neat, well-stocked store with exceptional service. How I'm gonna get there is again, the front of the store, uh, today, there's just a liquor sign on there. They have beer and wine. Adding that, working with the landlord to make sure that uh, we call that out would be part of my plan immediately. On the next slide, the interior of the store. Uh, currently, the, like I said earlier, the back of the house, I think, is doing a great job of selling liquor. 
The front part, uh, I would like to add some incremental merchandising at the front checkout. I think I can get more sales. Cut back the office a little bit to gain some more retail space on the sales floor. In the back room, some reconfigurations to make sure on the next page to make sure that there's no blind spots in the back room and kind of straighten that up. And then on the next slide, something I'm very passionate about, customer service. Uh, I think this is the lifeblood of our, any company, and it's, it's certainly uh, 1096. Greet every customer every day. Train the employees of the value of greeting the customer and saying hi, making sure that that's a part of a uh, also shoplifting deterrent to make sure that we're greeting customers. Become sales experts. I think the vendor's online training, it's free. And so we should take advantage of that. We should have certifications for our, customer, for our employees. Going to build trust with them and obviously build trust with the customers. Speed of checkout, I'll have a system in place to make sure that we call when we need to get more cashiers to the front of the store. Thanking every customer. And then last but not least, as far as customer service, social media. I think social media plays a huge part in customer service right now. And I think that posting content daily to my website, to the Facebook account, Twitter, and on monitoring online reviews is absolutely crucial to our business. Make every day a better day for the employees, the community, and our customers. As far as merchandising goes, I won't go through all the bullet points, but in stocks are definitely going to be important to me. You can't buy it if it's not there. Uh, local item selection. Local is really hot right now to make sure that we keep up with current trends. On the next slide, my 30, 60, 90 day plan. Again, I'll just call out a couple bullet points. 30 days, I'm going to meet with every one of our license and see customers right away. In 60 days, re-merchandise some of the non-liquor items in the store and join and meet some community groups in my local community. In 90 days, I'm going to improve the sign on the front of the building, upgrade those shelving and fixtures around the uh, register area, install channel stripping to call out some of the local items that we're selling. On the next slide, 17% uh, of Hillsborough population speaks Spanish and 9% in Oregon. I feel with the, the diversity that I can add <coughs> and the hiring I can do, definitely going to help serve our customers better and increase the sales. Have quarterly responsible vendor training for all of my associates. And then on the next slide, the hours of operation. I plan on expanding the hours Monday through Friday by one hour. On Friday and Saturday, an additional hour. And then on Sundays, 10 to 7 for an additional three hours. As far as security of the product, uh, Bruce has got a great camera system in place. I'll continue to keep that. We'll adjust camera angles to prevent blind spots. Customer service is a great deterrent for, uh, for theft. And then locking up high, high dollar items. And then wrapping up the financial outlook, I, the store's down about 700000 right now. I think I can get that back rather quickly with implementing some of these improvements. Thank you very much. Any questions? Any questions? You have a minute and a half to go. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. Good job. None? Well, for, uh, yeah. Uh, Brian, uh, when the candidates stated that the store is down... 700,000, did you say? Where, where did you get those numbers from? Uh, I got them from the from OLCC. Lost retail services. And, it, and that is, is totally due to, um, um, totally due to the increase of uh, stores in the uh, Hillsborough area? Yeah, so not seven, uh, Commissioner Harper, not 700,000 in uh, net to the store, but 700 gross sales, which is approximately 10% down. Okay. Uh, as a total store, this was a little north, I believe, of five million. Uh, we added two stores in Hillsborough, actually three. When you consider the east-facing store uh, along Baseline, we added Airport and the South End. Um, part of that, uh, as we went through expansion, was we knew that uh, Hillsborough, uh, the population at the time, and what's growing. Um, so some of it sets for future. I believe this store will grow. Uh, and usually that time frame mm -hmm. is uh, anywhere from 18 to 24 months. Okay. And with so. your, and uh, Mr. Boland, with your experience with uh, Safeway stores, you feel that you'll be able to increase that due to your your past merchandising experience and your past sales uh, within due to the fact that your history with a, a large store. Ab absolutely, I've done it time and time again. Like I said, I was a district manager for 26 stores. And that was my primary responsibility, identifying those opportunity stores, looking at what was, uh, you know, hurting that store, whether it was uh, customer service, in stock conditions, any of that, and then building the sales from there. So absolutely. Okay. Is there anything else we don't know about you? Uh, I rattled it off pretty quick, but uh, I'm high energy. Okay. I'm a simple guy. I, uh, you know, worked my whole life up through my career by hard work and working on the sales floor and, and just getting after it. So.
I have a quick question for you, Mr. Bullen. Um, so you were you were store director early on for Safeway and then district manager, and then you went back to being a store director? Correct. Uh, why did you go back to being a store director? Um, well, a couple, couple reasons. Um, our company's changed quite a bit. There was an opportunity to go back to being a store director at the same wage, and okay. so I took that opportunity. Um, I also uh, want to be a role model to my children. I keep preaching to my daughter to find what she loves to do and do it. And uh, I haven't necessarily always, always taken that advice, um, but now's my time to do that. And I want to be a leader to her too. And one last question. You've spent a career at Safeway. Why the change and what's, what's interested you in um, applying today? Um, that's, part of, that's part of why. Um, I wanted to be a leader to my children and an example. Um, I think that I'm at a point in my career at Safeway where I've done a lot. And I think that this is the next step for me to get out there and do it again in my own environment, in my own business. So. Okay, Brian, um, is the the total of sales, the 4.9, that's reflective of after the reduction of the 700,000? I just want to be clear. So this should have been at time of resignation. Okay. Um, so we when we do the estimates of resignation buyout, uh, so at time of resignation, because everything revolves <laughs> around that. Uh, if I believe correctly, this was fiscal year end, June 30, 19. Okay, so it does reflect the dip. In yeah, the at that point. So it has some attrition now or slight declines in sales, uh, but that's not included in this number um, because we run a rolling 12 as well as fiscal calendar. Yeah. Uh, okay. But I could certainly provide that. Yeah, I, it just helped from out there. Thank you. Uh, I... One, I want to congratulate you. I, I've seen a lot of these. I, I think this was an excellent presentation, especially putting in here the qualifications and the store analysis. Uh, we can read that on all the papers, but I, I liked it in here. And Thank you. I, I think that's great. My, my only question to you is, Bruce is the current agent? Correct. And he's got another store? Uh, Chair Rosenbaum, uh, Bruce and Gail Hochstein uh, have individual stores. So Gail was appointed after Bruce. So they don't have two stores, just Bruce. They've been a family, they've had the stores. Uh, Bruce is actually uh, coming up on 39 years. Uh, he did not choose to come today, but uh, he has 39 years as a liquor agent. His wife, I think is somewhere in the neighborhood of 20-ish uh, in uh, Forest Grove. So Bruce is, what you're saying is that you might lose some licensees and employees from the store because they like them so much they're going with them. Yeah, I met with Bruce. I actually probably spent four hours with Bruce. And um, in talking to Bruce, the current manager at 1096 Hillsboro is going to be going to the Forest Grove location. He's been offered a position there, so I definitely will lose that employee. And then he does have some great relationships with some of the licensees. So don't know for sure that I would lose those, but absolutely that's an opportunity for me. Okay. Uh, do you have people in mind that you're going to bring in to help you? I've got a lot of people. Uh -huh. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Robert. Thank okay. Next up on the deck is Holly. Holly Hassan, come on up. And I believe you're bringing up the PowerPoint. There we go. Remember, state your name. I'm going to let my husband take the floor. Perfect. <laughs> yep, thank you. Yep, that's good to watch here. It's gone. It is. It's gone. Sorry, it turned off. I have to turn it back on. Good morning. Um, good morning. Chairman Rosenbaum, commissioners. It's a beautiful morning this morning. I couldn't believe how nice it was anyway. It's, it's a little chilly, but it's gorgeous. No, it's just gorgeous. <laughs> Thank you for your time this morning. My name is Holly Hassan. I'm the agent at Bethany Liquor Store 1243. I have 40 years retail experience, including being the agent at Bethany Liquor for six and a half years. When I was appointed the agent in 2013, we started with 1,000 SKUs and sales of 1.7 million. Today we're at 1,700 SKUs with sales nearing 3 million with the average daily sale of 8,000. 
Bethany neighborhood has few restaurants and bars, yet we've built up our licensee business from 26,000 to 120,000 by creating long lasting relationships with them. All this was accomplished by extending our hours, offering products that customers and licensees demand along with giving great customer service. We've also forged a strong relationship with the community and are very proud to have been featured in a two page article in the Bethany Living Magazine this past year. Having a, a sales floor of 875 square feet, I'm very proud of these accomplish, accomplishments and all the credit goes to my fantastic team. Bethany has received outstanding reviews, near perfect audits, never had a violation for selling to a minor, and have been recognized for being the top three of Scotch sales in Oregon. On page three, we strive to meet the needs of our customers and are committed to giving exceptional customer service. We use social media such as Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to increase our reach and appreciate the many five-star reviews and nice comments on both Google and Yelp. Showing you here are just a few from Google. I stay active on our Facebook page, trying to keep people engaged. Now I'd like to share with you my business plan for the Hillsboro Liquor. As the chart shows, Hillsboro has done a great business of over $5 million a year, but has had a decline in sales the last few years. I believe much of it can be attributed to moving the location and the arrival of new stores in the area now sharing in some of the business. I'm confident if appointed to be the new agent, this trend can be reversed and then I can increase overall sales. My plan is to do the following, extend hours by 15 hours a week. They are now, um, they close at like seven during the week and eight o'clock on the weekends and uh, we will stay open until nine during the week and on weekends we'll stay open until 10. Um, I will introduce both Ash, my husband, and myself to the current licensees to establish relationships with them, increase inventory and SKUs per customer demand. Hillsboro being a non-exclusive store has the opportunity to increase revenue, so I will bring in more related items to liquor, wine, and beer. Implement media strategies such as Facebook, web presence, Instagram, and Twitter, and will offer weekly tastings to introduce new products to the customers. Now I'd like to <coughs> share with you the demographics for Hillsboro. According to the state of Oregon, the Hillsboro area is expected to have a growth of 20% in the next five years. The construction of three major housing developments are already well underway. The median age of the current population is 34 and the median household income is 75,000. This makes me confident that we can increase sales at Hillsboro Liquor by 10% overall. I am certain that I can manage both stores. Logistically, the two stores are 20 minutes apart and the plan is to work at the Hillsboro at least 40 hours a week. With the help of my current management team at Bethany, I feel comfortable committing a full-time uh, to developing the business plan at Hillsboro. If appointed, my plan is to keep all the current employees at Hillsboro since they're already familiar with the customer base. To further manage the two stores, I will use advanced technology to monitor the store via remote access in my absence as we currently do at Bethany. I plan On page seven, I plan to keep the existing layout of the store, but plan to modernize the outside by replacing the current sign and decals on the windows as shown. Within the store, I also plan to replace category <coughs> signs, making it easier for customers to find products. As you can see on page nine, there's a long bay blocking the front desk. I plan to remove that to make a clear walkway to the front desk. Um, plan on page 10, it shows our expenses and budget for the endeavor. Page 11 summarizes our business plan. And page 12, you will find my letters of recommendation. In closing, I'm very proud of the success that Bethany has seen over the past six and a half years, and I'm confident to take on a second store. I think that applying a similar strategy to Hillsboro has great potential for success. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy. My husband and I are both here to we'd be happy to answer you. Sure. Um, uh, Ms. Bowen, can you, can you move the, take the slide back to, two slide back, 
so I can give a chance one more so I can just read here. Thank you. Any questions? Oh, just one. Um, you mentioned you've got the Bethany store. Uh, what percentage of, lic uh, is of your business is licensee sales out of Bethany? Oh, boy. I'd say about 5%. Yeah. Because the Bethany area is really not conducive to any uh, restaurants or, uh, or bars for that matter. Yeah. So uh, that sort of uh, restricts us into answering the, the, the available restaurants that are in the area sure. that we have captured. Yeah. No, we touched on it before, I think, but I think with the the Hockensteins with their, their, they've got a big licensee business yeah. there, and I think that's going to be an important thing just to be Absolutely. mindful. Absolutely. You mean the store now has? Yeah, the, they, but they they're going to lose some of that. I yeah, think. I mean they're because the, the yeah. they could facilitate it a lot of it probably out of Forest Grove if they wanted to, or they could. Uh, so I think that that store is going to really require uh, a focus on licensee Absolutely. business would be my thought. Absolutely, it will, it will definitely require a focus that on it. That was exactly my point. Yeah. They've already lost um, several accounts, and because Bruce told us, we, we spent a lot of time with Bruce also, and mm -hmm. he did say that he lost a couple of accounts already, and that his manager was probably going to be going with him and would probably be taking at least three accounts with him. So we know that, and I think he said he had nine, so... I'm pretty sure we, we will have to work very hard going out and introducing ourselves to lots of restaurants and bars. Cool. And not only that, we also, uh, with the Bethany environment, we offer sort of a semi-management approach to all our clients, four or five that we have. So we provide them with um, monthly sales. When, when OLCC comes up with a spreadsheet, we, uh, uh, we work with them and send them the worksheet so they say at least it's nothing that they could plan for the next month uh, on their inventory. So a source, some of those small management uh, that we provide as a courtesy uh, so they understand where, where the market is, where uh -huh. the pricing are, and what are some of the products that are in the market that they can actually come in and introduce and stay ahead of everybody else. Uh, Commissioner Melitas, four, he is right, uh, approximately 4%, a little more, rolling 12 months. Mm -hmm. For this store, uh, currently almost 32% licensee sales, uh -huh. and actually on a growth trend, it's the counter sales, obviously, with adding stores uh, that has been the, the primary uh, loss. So decent volume here in terms of the back door or licensee business. Yeah. That helps. Was that, a, was that an area of discussion? By the uh, staff in in considering what applicants were going to come in for this store specifically, yeah. the, uh, I think we all hit on the same point. Uh, it's uh, the the store is uh, it's going to lose some business. It's going to lose some employees. Uh, so, Chair Rosenbaum, so, to answer your question, um, the applicants that are here. Fully qualified and fully understand the current status okay. of the store. Okay. Um, that's my point. Yeah, that's absolutely. Every one of them was clear the downward uh, growth trend and new stores, but they recognize what's happening around the store in terms of growth. The growth boundary expanded dramatically. Yeah. Okay. Well, we keep our management structure on, in both stores, so this is at least nothing else. Um, I have six years of experience with my from the inception of Bethany. So I'm, I'm going to contribute my time both to the, uh, uh, to the Hillsborough as well as uh, Bethany. And then we have a very, very good trained management team that is able to in place, uh, in fact, come in place. And in case there's a replacement, uh, we can fulfill those gaps. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. With that, I'll bring up, thanks, Holly and Ash. Next applicant is Jacob Miller. Chair. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> You've been in before, right, Have Jacob? Yes. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. Thanks, Jacob. Okay, just remember to keep your name for the record. My name is Jacob Miller, and I just want to start saying I really appreciate you guys for allowing me to present to you today. It's a, it's a real honor. Table of contents is on page two there. Um, you guys can reference that as we go today. I actually want to go ahead and skip over pages three and four. You guys have seen my applications. Um, you know the work history. Uh, you know, I've spent some time managing other OLCC liquor stores. But I do want to preface the whole, the whole presentation by saying that although I appreciate that experience, um, I'm kind of, me and my wife are ready to kind of start our own legacy. You know, we want to move up to Hillsboro, um, you know, really dedicate ourselves to this store, resign from ham markets. Uh, even the store that I own, the grocery store, I've put a manager in about a year ago just really trying to prepare myself for opportunities like this. So let's get into the store. Uh, city of Hillsborough currently has just over 100,000 people. Uh, they're expecting a 15 to 25 percent growth over the next seven years. OLCC has wisely put new, two new stores in the area because of this. Um, we've seen a drop in sales, as previously mentioned. But I want to show you guys today how I think I can turn that around in an expedited fashion. Uh, big ones having sufficient staff to greet customers at the detour to theft. Um, you know, a, a proper dress code, including name tags. I also want to train my staff in liquor and in, you know, knowledge of liquor, but also, you know, the, the proper service to the community as far as not selling to minors or intoxicated individuals. I also really want to be involved in the Hillsborough com community. I take big responsibility in employment, and there's actually 15 employees there currently. And then also I'd like to spend my time and resources in school, school programs. You know, I'm a big baseball and basketball fan. I've coached some baseball teams. You know, it's important to spend time in the community, not just sign checks to things. Uh, hours of operation, uh, I want to increase them by six hours initially. That could expand depending on how things go, but I expect a 5 to 10% growth because of those six hours. I've also seen in other parts of the state that when one store increases hours, the stores around them tend to as well. So that's kind of a double bonus for OLCC. Now, pages 8, 9, and 10 kind of all go together. You have the current store layout, the proposed store layout, and then some stuff we can do because of that. I've spent a lot of time in the store, and the first thing I would do on page 8 there is the gondola that runs uh, vertical with the groceries and cordials. I would pull that out. Uh, that would allow us to control traffic a little bit better, have ample displays like you see on the bottom of page 10, uh, have room for vendors to come in and do tastings. Uh, we can also extend the shelves, so the shelves that run horizontal, the four shelves, it would allow us to extend those by 8 feet each. And then what we could do is spend, you know, use Olas and use Randy, our district manager, to really allocate space based on sales and get that store set properly. I'd also like to pull the freezers out from behind the counter. Uh, you know, the, the customer needs to be able to touch it and feel it and shop it. Uh, so those are some of the things I would do. Also on the top of page 10 on the left, that's what the store currently looks like. I would want to make it look like the, the picture on the right. Drop that fourth shelf down. It just opens up the store. Uh, makes it more inviting, but also is another deterrent to theft, just because it's you can it's a better visual for the clerks. Um, on page 11, other improved merchandising. Uh, have a made in Oregon section. Have a new product section. Cross merchandise things. You know, take some rum and put it in the Coke cooler. Uh, all these items would still be in their normal spots, but this would just be more allocation for liquor. Other store improvements. Top left on page 12. That's what it looks like now. I would propose the top right, just spruce up the signs, spruce up the window decals. There in the middle, the category signs, you can hardly see them. I'd want to get those nice signs that hang out over the shelves so you know customers <coughs> really know what they're shopping. Uh, I would add a monitor right when you walk in the door. That way customers see themselves. You know, It's just another deterrent to theft. And then make sure you keep a clean, well-lit store. Those are kind of the basics that are important. Marketing tools, I have experience uh, starting and running a, a business page that has almost 3,000 followers. Uh, we have a text club that has over 400 members and an email list that has over 1,600 subscribers. Um, and this is in Southern Oregon, so if you know, there's more population, I, I think I can boost these. Those are local people that want to you know, shop in your store. So you, you put on, hey, we got a new item, and boom, they're in there shopping. Another one is Google reviews. You know, 
respond to people. You're not a robot. You're a part of their community. Other marketing tools on page 14, I want to use an app called Cocktail Flow, and this allows you to actually look up recipes while you shop. So instead of grabbing margarita mix, you actually might grab triple sec and amaretto and tequila, so it ups the sales. It also gives our clerks an opportunity to upsell things. And then what I want to do is once I gather enough of this information, I want to give it back to you guys and see if it's something you guys want to implement in other stores. Economic projections, um, I actually based all mine on the consumer sales. I know it's tough to run a bar and run a restaurant, um, but you guys have the, the licensee sales no matter what. So I still need to offer good service. I'll deliver. I'll do all that stuff. But the consumer sells what's down 30% in this store, and that's what I really want to focus on. Um, I expect to, you know, through improved marketing, merchandising, uh, the 15 to 25% growth of Hillsboro, extra hours that we can turn that around quickly and uh, by 2027 be doing just under $5.7 in consumer sales. And that was based on a 10% growth. Um, timeline on investment, two things I want to highlight. The second January 2020, 132295 that was per Bruce. That's for the beer and wine and tobacco inventory, the beer cave that's in there. That's money that we need to have ready so there's no hiccups when we turn this thing over. So I've acquired that. Also, additional monies will include an extra 25000 in funds, and that's something I always want to keep just from my past experience in businesses. You know, If our beer cooler goes down, we need to have money to qu- fix it quickly. We don't want to lose liquor customers because they don't come to us anymore because we don't have cold beer. So they're going to 7-Eleven now. In conclusion, I believe I have the tools and experience, experience to successfully run this store. I'll focus on a safe and responsible sales and great customer service. Uh, another great way is this lease actually is up in 2025, and then there's a 10-year option. What that allows us to do, get in the store, run it for a couple of years, and then I can talk with Randy. I can talk with Brian. Are we servicing the community properly in this location, or do we want to make the investment and possibly move somewhere else? Um, I want to focus on, you know, I believe I'm qualified now, but focus on getting better. You know, use Randy. Use other liquor agents, including my father. Use liquor reps. Use OLOS. Use the yearly education training that you guys allot to us. Um, you know, it's it's important not to be stagnant. So, um, again, even Bruce, you know, get in with Bruce in December. And what an opportunity. I already know how to do the ordering and all that stuff. But get to know your employees. Get to know your customers. That's a huge advantage. Um, again, I just I really appreciate your guys' time today. Um, and I, I'm really excited. My wife and I are excited to really devote ourselves to just this store if, if we are appointed. If you guys have any questions, let me know. Chair. Uh, Mr. Miller, you've been here before. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Um, there's a couple of us that haven't heard your story. So I'm, I'm, I'm interested um, in particular with, tell us briefly about your management history with OLCC. And I'm assuming it's with the, the boss in the ham market. Uh, right? Yes, correct. Markets. So ham markets is my father's company. Okay. I moved back from college to help grow that. Um, and then he has four stores, including two liquor stores through the retail expansion. And then one was a non-exclusive in Canyonville. Um, so I'm running these stores within grocery stores. But, you know, I got the experience of doing the ordering, you know, how to bring new products and timely deposits is an important thing with OLCC, you know, make sure you're getting your money and all that stuff. Um, and then as we grew that business, I ended up purchasing two of the stores, which is Boss Markets. Mm-hmm. And so I own those two. Those are just convenience stores. There's no liquor in them. And those are the ones I spoke to of putting a manager in about a year ago, just kind of setting myself up for opportunities like this. So. Okay. Um, what is your uh, intention with the, the boss markets, and would you uh, sell those and relocate, or are you uh, planning on I'm, keeping I'm relocating, for okay. sure. I actually would not sell it. Um, my aunt, who actually has been working for my dad forever, I stole her. Um, she's <laughs> running it. She taught me a ton. If there's anything that needs to take care of, I mean, he's still a big part of that, that business as well. So I have confidence that that'll be taken care of. Now, passive income is not a thing. So there will be times where I'll go down on the weekends or, you know, it's not like I can completely walk away. Mm -hmm. But I plan on spending 40, 50 hours in this store every single week and relocating up here. Okay. So thank you. (coughs) Thank you. Of course. Any other questions? Chair. Commissioner? Mr. Miller, um, you you never miss an opportunity to brag about your family. Yeah. And when you first started, you you said, well, everybody knows about my personal profile. I have a beautiful wife in there for 36 mm-hmm. years. I always brag about her. Yeah. <laughs> it seems that she's your current bookkeeper. 
Mm -hmm. um, at the stores in Eagle Point. Does, does she plan on coming up with you? Or? Yes, yes. Okay, so your aunt will be the bookkeeper then? No, she'll still do the bookkeeping. A lot uh -huh. of the bookkeeping is all mobile now. Um, my wife actually, we, as in the picture, you can see we have two young kids. Mm -hmm. My wife never goes to work with me at all. She works from home doing all the payroll, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And just to address the uh, skipping over that, we yeah. talked about that. That was kind of something that um, – you know, for the future of our family, she was like, let's get, she kind of has my mentality. She was like, don't, don't worry about me. Like get to the store. Don't worry about yourself too much. They've seen your experience. Get to the store. You know, like, again, I have a beautiful family and that's, you yeah. know, but uh, we appreciate that. trying to go through, you know, trying to, to better ourselves. You know, she was like, let's skip it. Let's, let's get to the store and tell them how you can better this store. So well, you go home and tell her, but never skip you. I will. Yeah. I'll give her, <laughs> I'll say, I'll, yeah. I'll say commissioner Harper chewed yeah. me out for that. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I just uh, appreciate one thing that I noticed in your presentation that, that maybe the other candidates will not hit on is the branding. Mm -hmm. I, I, I really appreciate the fact that you understand that this business takes a specific brand and what you're doing. And um, I, I really appreciate that and, and your focus thank you. on how you're going to uh, achieve success in, in this business. So thank you so much for, for thank getting you. that out. I appreciate and especially that. the opportunity to, to give back to us here at the commission and, 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 and share how your successes um, made your business successful. So thank you, Mr. Miller. Thank you. I appreciate that. Any others? Mr. Chair. May just I, I want to compliment you as well on uh, many of the points made, but also to point out the fact that you, know, you had a little bit of vision going on apparently with uh, um, uh, speaking to the lease uh, that exists mm -hmm. there now. Um, a question I have for you, you know, knowing where you are, where you, where you want to mm -hmm. end up, um, the energy it will take to do that. Are oh, you, are you, massive. Yes. yes. And to be completely honest with you, that's something that I just wanted to throw in, you know, spending a little bit of time in that store with Bruce. It's kind of back in the corner. Yeah. There's actually a newer shopping center right next door. You obviously can't, with the new stores in the area, you can't pick up and move it miles sure. down the street. And it's something that I don't even have any anticipation in doing that right now. But what an opportunity for, even if I'm not a point of the agent, for any of the agents. Like, we get to run this store for five years and then, like I said, we can talk with Brian, talk with Randy. You know, I don't know if you guys would be a part of that decision. And, hey, a lease came up right here. Should we keep it here or should we spend that? Because it would sure. be – it would probably take a couple of weeks to move all that. It's a big store with a lot of product. But, you know, in the long run, is it – maybe we say no and well, then it's over. I, uh, I applaud your, your vision and uh, innovation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? That's it. Thank you, guys. I, I really appreciate it. Thanks, Jacob. Okay, we have our last applicant today, Christina Van. Hello. Good morning, Commissioners, Chair Rosenbaum. It's an honor to be here and share my proposal with you two uh, for the Hillsborough Liquor Store. Uh, my name is Christine Mann. Uh, I reside in Donald. It's a small town south of Wilsonville. Uh, I have spent 26 years in the food and beverage industry, 21 of those years in restaurant management, and 15 in corporate management training. I am proficient in inventory, labor, food cost, and waste control. For seven years, I was a regional training manager for Roundtable Development Corporation, where I analyzed P&L statements and evaluated 24 stores, making recommendations for remodels and restructuring to ensure failing stores became profitable. I am currently general manager of the Wild Hair Saloon in Canby and work part-time at the North Wilsonville Liquor Store working for Jesse and Tiffany Stafford. Uh, I have spent some time uh, as an intern with Heather and Andy Dorn at the Canby Liquor Store as well. 
Again, I thank you for allowing me uh, to present my vision to you. Uh, to drive sales by providing the Hillsborough community an exemplary shopping experience through superior customer service with a unique variety of products in a convenient, stylish environment. The city of Hillsborough is the fifth largest city in the state, housing approximately 102,000 people. Uh, Hillsborough and surrounding metro areas are referred to as the Silicon Forest, with companies like Intel, HP, and Xerox not to mention other large corporate headquarters such as Kaiser Permanente, Nike, and Wells Fargo. This gives Hillsborough a unique and diverse demographic, not only the consumers residing there, but the tens of thousands commuting in and out of the city every day. Currently, the Hillsborough Liquor Store has one year left on its lease and a five-year extension. It is my intention to leave it at this location until the end of 2025. At the beginning of that year, it would be prudent to reevaluate the location. The South Hillsboro housing project on Blanton Street will be finishing its uh, first stages of its first phase, thus adding a proposed 7,000 residents to the area. At that time, moving the store to a location visible from TV Highway may be necessary to capture additional customers. The Hillsboro Liquor Store does just under $5 million in annual sales, approximately $3.5 million over the counter and another $1.5 million to licensees. It currently holds roughly 50 accounts with local bars and restaurants. The store was recently moved four years ago, and Bruce did a wonderful job with the build-out. It has an amazing walk-in cooler uh, filled with our local craft beer, wine, and hard ciders. The decor is contemporary, and the shelving is in great condition, <coughs> and the lighting is excellent. Uh, but there are room for improvements within the space provided. First, I do want to extend the hours. We will be um, moving from the current hours to 9 a.m. Monday through Saturday and staying open until 9 p.m. Monday through Thursday and 10 p.m. on Fridays and Saturdays and extending Sunday to 10 to 7. Uh, the additional hours will heavily impact sales. I will create a new website, posting the new hours, as well as tasting schedules, recipes, and activities, and join the community's social media pages. I will introduce myself to licensees as well as local artisans. We want to support our community uh, by showcasing other local vendors and carrying their unique products. Inside the store, we will make some small improvements. Um, we will be replacing the front counter with something a little less dated and more welcoming to showcase our unique and rare spirits. Uh, opposite the front door is a wall lined with standalone coolers. Those will be removed to make room for a dedicated Made in Oregon section, adding another 120 feet of shelving, thus opening space on the existing shelves for increased variety. Next to that, we will have a movable cabinet that will serve as a dedicated tasting area that can be repositioned back against the wall and utilized as a display case for the spirit of the week. I will also be removing the glass display case and paraphernalia just inside the front door and replacing it with Gondola Island to improve the selection of spirits and related items. We can't forget, we are not selling a product. We are selling an experience. By creating this new ambiance, we will give the community a modern and unique shopping environment. Our staff will be trained and knowledgeable, as well as personable and inviting. We will host tastings and feature local artisan products paired with our Oregon distilled spirits and wine. By presenting displays with glassware, party supplies, novelty items, and gift ideas, we are providing our customers a convenient one-stop shop, thus enhancing their experience. Current licensee sales are just under $1.5 million, and I would love to capture more. I will be going out and forming relationships in the community making sure our current licensees are receiving the level of care that they deserve and pursuing new accounts. I have already begun networking through family, friends, and previous employers and have secured accounts for the future. My goal is to see at least a 20% increase by the end of 2020 and the full 34% forecasted increase by the end of 2021. Uh, with the new hours, the new and upgraded spirits, small cosmetic modifications, and some additional licensee accounts, I believe this is an attainable number. All of our staff will be required to hold a current OLCC service permit as part of a new house policy. I want each team member to have the opportunity to hold tastings and to gain knowledge of our products. As representatives of the OLCC, it is our duty to provide quality service to our customers 
while maintaining public safety. I hope I have provided the information that you need to make a confident decision about my capability to enhance this store. I believe my experience, dedication, and drive will allow me to One accomplish minute. the goals I have set for myself. And thank you very much for allowing me to present to you today. Questions? Um, you uh, you were here before, and then uh, it looked like you you started working with the Staffords over at the uh, Stafford Beverage. How are you enjoying that? Are you liking that? I do. I love it. Um, and the. <sighs> The guys that he has working there, especially um, Josh Harden, his uh, manager, they are so knowledgeable. I have learned, I can't even tell you how many different things about everything just working in the store. It's amazing the level of information I was able to absorb. And I still have like so far to go. It's, I mean, it's, they're constantly changing, bringing in new products. But um, I did get to be a part of um, picking a barrel pick, which was amazing. And it was actually the one I picked, so I felt really, really good about that. But it was, it was amazing. It's been an amazing experience, and I really appreciated him giving me the opportunity to have that. Mm -hmm. And you've looked at this uh, particular, because it's got some. It's a big store. It's, it, it is, it's yes. A lot, a lot of sales. Fifty, six hundred square feet. And, yeah. yeah. Well, and, and just in terms of volume, too, it's doing a mm -hmm. lot of sales. But there's, yes. I mean, there's some uniqueness to it. I think, and, and Chair touched on the. Um, the loss of licensee sales will be important to focus on that. Absolutely. The on that. And it sounds like you're prepared for that. But also I am. the, um, uh, so I, I think it's, uh, yeah, but you're, you're mindful that the, the licensee sales will probably be a, an area to focus There will on. be a small hit. Um, uh, there was some conversation earlier about uh, Sterling and Bruce taking some of those to the Forest Grove store. Um, I met with Sterling yesterday, actually, and he has not made up his mind. Um we sat down and talked about salary and hours and what it, you know, and he said that Bruce did make him an offer, but Bruce also told him to be open-minded and see what, what whatever agent gets signed to see what they're offering. He may want to stay. He does have connections with the staff and he does have connections with a lot of the licensees and he's not opposed to staying. He also did say if that wasn't necessarily a good fit, he would be willing to, come by a couple days a week on a consulting basis to help transition. Hmm. It's Sterling's the manager. Sterling's oh, the manager, okay. yes. Okay. Yeah, so I you. wanted to make sure I was prepared. Would I, you know, am I going to go into this blind or am I going to have some help? And uh, quite honestly, he, like I said, he's still kind of on the fence. But I also told him, um, you don't need me, but I need you. So you kind of have me at a disadvantage. So we're, we'll talk very carefully about what it's going to take to keep him. That's never a good negotiator. Yeah. I wasn't trying to negotiate. I was trying to keep him. <laughs> so, Chair Rosenbaum, Commissioners, uh, for the record, I do know Bruce. Bruce is a stand-up uh, agent. Mm -hmm. uh, he's yeah. been around a long time. He's committed to any one of the applicants today to try and help him in the transition. Uh, Sterling has a big part of the licensee business, or been a part of it, but he's also encouraging, and this is as of yesterday, spoke with the DM, says, no, he's encouraged every single licensee he currently has to stay and then at a later date consider different options. They have lost one licensee to date, uh, but that's natural uh, mm -hmm. when stores resign, retire. So that applies to everyone that's here. Uh, Chair Rosenbaum. I, this is for all of you. I'm in the world of sales. Sometimes they don't like the fact that I comb my hair to the side anymore. <laughs> Sometimes they fact, love the fact that I don't have any hair. I'm not worried about the licensees going away. And you shouldn't be either. So provide the quality of service that you're talking about. You'll be fine. And by the way, I think all of you are great. So thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Um, Ryan, I, I failed to ask each candidate, and you can probably... You have the answer. How many of the four candidates ever attended any agent training uh, sessions? Uh, so I'll have to one, two. Two are existing um, uh, relationship. Uh, so two have. Two have never been a part of our OLCC agent system, so okay. they have not. And which two are those? Uh, so Holly has attended as well as Jacob uh, with his father. All right. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. The commissioners will now go into, oh, by the way, I just want to say, uh, all four, I think I can talk for the commission, uh, all four were excellent, excellent. I mean, we've been around here long enough to, to know the difference, and uh, all four of you were great. It, it, it'll make for a lively discussion. <laughs> the commissioners will now go into executive session to deliberate on the agent selection pursuant to the authority of ORS 192.660 sub 2 sub A. If there are members of the media present, representative of the news media and designated staff shall be allowed to attend the executive session. Representative of the media are specifically directed not to report on any of the deliberations during the executive session except to state the general subject of the session as previously announced. No decisions may be made in the executive session. We will return to open session in this room. We are temporarily adjourned. We're back in session. Wow. I waiting for Marvin. Oh, one more. It's not my fault. It's on you. Oh, goodness. Well, um, we'll take another second or two. <laughs> Commissioner Rubel is not here. <laughs> I guess while we're waiting, Chair, can I just, uh, I want to emphasize again what great presentations there were today and how long it took us and how long we were gone is just evidence of how well everybody did because it was not an easy decision. And we realize that um, these are important decisions. They're affecting a lot of lives. And we do take it very seriously, even though you might see us smiling or joking about things as we come out. Um, but we did spend a lot of time back there um, seriously devoted to trying to make a good decision. And I think that, and truly, honestly, everybody would be successful that we saw today. Yes. Um, and so it's unfortunate that we get to only pick one. So hopefully I would we'll say see, that. Yeah, hopefully we'll see some of them again. <laughs> yeah, and, and that on that note, too, um, we would appreciate seeing you again if you're not going to be the person getting the slot today. Well said. Thank you. Uh, um, I think we're just going to make the motion okay? at this point, and then we'll go from there. Uh, so, Chair. Commissioner. I move to appoint Robert Boland as the permanent agent of store number 1096 Hillsboro, effective January 2020. Commissioner Curran. Yes. Commissioner Floyd. Yes. Commissioner Harper. Yes. Commissioner Molinas. Yes. Commissioner Palsic. Yes. Commissioner Raval. Not present. We'll leave the roll open for him. Okay. Chair Rosenbaum. Yes. Again, thank everybody. Congratulations. Oh. Uh, is he coming? There you go. We left the roll open for you. <coughs> present. Commissioner Raval. Here. Yes, sir. Yes. Sorry. Chair Rosenbaum, commissioners, thank you so much uh, for the applicants that have been asked to come back. They're serious, and this is not often they say that, so please uh, heed their advice. Uh, you're all phenomenal applicants. Yes. And thank you Indeed. for helping us on this. Yes, thank you. Okay, contested case hearing, the Speakeasy Lounge. Michael, welcome. Thank you, Chair Rosenbaum. <coughs> Good morning, Chair Rosenbaum, Good morning. members of the commission. Good morning. I'm Michael Schein from AP&P. Uh, joining me here at the table, immediately to my left, is Michael Mills, the attorney for licensee KRH Hospitality, LLC. Uh, then to his left, Kevin Hoffman, and to his left, Lou Woodsky, who are members of the uh, business uh, DBA Speakeasy Lounge. The Speakeasy is located at the corner of Southeast 162nd Avenue and Southeast Stark Street in Portland. 
Uh, before you today is a liquor compliance action based on notice of proposed license cancellation that was sent out May 9, 2018. After issuing a first, second, and then third amended notice, the case was tried for five days from June 10 to June 14, 2019. Before you for entry as a final order is Senior Administrative Law Judge Joe Allen's proposed order, a 26-page opinion in which he recommends cancellation and non-renewal of the speakeasy's full on-premises liquor license based primarily on a history of serious and persistent <coughs> problems at the premises. So I'm going to present the commission's case, then turn things over to Mr. Mills to argue his client's exceptions to the proposed order of cancellation, after which I will ask for a chance to respond to Mr. Mills before you retire to deliberate. We will confine our remarks to the evidence of record and to the exceptions filed, and we will each try to limit our remarks to about 10 to 15 minutes. Authority to operate Speakeasy Lounge was first granted to Mr. Hoffman back in January 2017. Mr. Hoffman had worked for more than 30 years as a contractor in California, and he had no prior experience in the bar business. At first, he relied on hired managers, but he moved to Oregon in May 2017 and began personally managing the premises in June 2017. In February 2018, he added Ms. Woodski as his partner. In the third amended notice, we charged a history of serious and persistent problems based on 28 incidents over a 22-month period from April 13, 2017 to February 16, 2019. Under the, commissioners, under the commission's penalty schedule, this is a Category 1 violation with a presumptive penalty of license cancellation. Uh, in addition, the notice ch uh, charged a false statement violation and a failure to evict a patron after a disturbance violation. The proposed order concludes that all three violations are well-founded. So as I said, this matter was heard for five days from June 14, or June 10 to June 14, 2019. 32 witnesses testified on behalf of the commission and five witnesses testified on behalf of the licensee. These witnesses included the licensees, Mr. Hoffman and Ms. Witzke, who got to tell their version of the events in question, as well as OLCC inspectors Joe Welp, Gary Wellborn, and David Staniford, OLCC statewide alcohol compliance technician Carly Vetter, Jenny Glass, who's executive director of a neighboring business, a nonprofit called the Rosewood Initiative, and 27 law enforcement officers from Portland Police, Gresham Police, and Multnomah County Sheriff's Office. In addition to all this testimony, the ALJ admitted and reviewed 38 agency exhibits and 36 licensee exhibits. <coughs> Based on all that evidence, plus substantial written briefing filed by Mr. Mills and myself, Judge Allen uh, found or proposed that the commission find that staff had proven 26 serious incidents in 22 months at the speakeasy. To quote from the proposed order at page 19, these incidents or those incidents included 21 instances of violence or drugs in and around the licensed premises with five of those instances involving gun violence targeted at patrons of the licensed premises or at the premises itself. In addition, at least three of the established serious incidents included minors. Now, of course, there are too many instances or incidents to discuss each one here separately, but I want to just mention a few representative incidents that will give you a sense of what has been happening at the speakeasy. Uh, here's an incident from July 5, 2017. I'm going to quote some excerpts from Finding of Fact 13 and 14 in the proposed order. At approximately 2.25 a.m. on July 5, 2017, several Portland police officers responded to the licensed premises after multiple reports of a large altercation and one or more gunshots. A witness on scene reports seeing a gun fired into the air in the parking lot in front of the licensed premises. The altercation began inside the licensed premises between females who were escorted outside. 
One of the females identified as Mathis was driving a red Mustang. The other females drove a white SUV. Responding officers observed a red Mustang chasing a white SUV down Southeast Stark Street. Officers then observed the Mustang pull into the parking lot shared by Sue Casa and the licensed premises at a high rate of speed. Officer Alicer Renander made contact with Mathis and observed she, observed she was bleeding from her face. Mathis told Officer Renander that she had been in a fight at the licensed premises. Mathis then got back into the Mustang and chased the white SUV across the parking lot. In the process, Mathis nearly struck Officer Renander with her vehicle. A physical altercation between approximately six to eight females ensued in the parking lot in front of Sue Casa, which is a neighboring business in the same uh, strip mall. The fight spilled onto the sidewalk and the traffic lanes of Southeast Stark Street. Officer Lino Pavone had to deploy pepper spray on the aggressor Mathis to break up the altercation. So as you can see from this kind of an event, there are multiple risks of public safety. Obviously, a gunshot, a fighting, a car chase in the public streets, uh, nearly running down a peace officer who's engaged in trying to quell the disorder, and then fighting that spills out into the street, which is a hazard both to the combatants and to motorists passing by. Uh, here's another incident from July 16, 2017, from finding of fact number 17. Portland officers entered the parking lot of the premises to address an individual drinking alcohol in front of the licensed premises when they observed two young males loitering in front of the premises. Upon making contact with the individuals, Officer Curtis learned that one of the individuals was 20 years old and the other was only 16 years old. The two males were interacting with patrons going in and out of the licensed premises. The officers observed the 16-year-old male smoking marijuana in front of the licensed premises and took him into custody for trespass. When the officers were conducting the arrest, a crowd of about 10 patrons came out of the licensed premises to observe the incident. One of the patrons attempted to interfere with the officers. While transporting the underaged individual home, Officer Curtis asked him why he was at the licensed premises. He stated to the officers that he was waiting on one of three girls that he pimps. So obviously public safety risks again, minors loitering outside a no minors establishment, interacting with the patron, patrons, engaged in criminal drug and prostitution activities, minors engaged in that, and again, a documented threat to peace officers trying to carry out their duties. Um, I guess I'll read one more um, from October 5, 2018, finding of fact 37, a witness report hearing a verbal argument coming from the parking lot of the licensed premises. Uh, again, this is October 2018, followed by multiple gunshots fired near the front of the licensed premises. According to Portland police reports, the intended target of the shooting was a patron of the licensed premises named Terrence Yeggins. Licensee staff report that Yeggins visited the licensed premises at least once a week. Video surveillance revealed that Yeggins was one of the individuals involved in the verbal argument in the parking lot, which immediately preceded the gunshots. PPB, Portland Police, and Gresham Police personnel recovered at least nine shell casings from a 40 caliber handgun. Police also found that at least three bullets struck the exterior front of the licensed premises. Uh, each of these bullets penetrated the wall and entered the licensed premises. Bullets also struck at least two vehicles in the parking lot of the licensed premises, a gold Buick belonging to Yeggins and a white SUV parked nearby. And without reading, I'll mention another shooting from March 31, 2018 that's documented in findings 26, 27, and 20, 28. And in that one, bullets that were fired by a patron who had been inside the premises and came out to fire at a vehicle that was speeding away down the parking lot were actually pried out of the wall of an adjoining apartment building. So an obvious public safety risk, not only gun violence, but a serious risk of deadly harm to nearby residents based on the bullet strikes to the neighboring apartment building. 
Both these incidents were related by witnesses, police officers with lots of experience from what was at the time called the gang enforcement team to gang violence, both these firearm incidents. Now, I want to be clear, this is related not to gang membership. We agree that the risk of a gang presence at a licensed premise is not the membership per se, which is legal, but the illegal activities that are associated with gang membership, such as drive-by shootings, that according to the testimony of officers who were charged with enforcement with lots of experience in it, uh, they stated that gang members engage in these activities with proven frequency. Now I'd like to turn our attention to the question of willingness and ability to control the premises. Once a history of serious and persistent problems has been shown, the licensee has the burden of proving that it has both the willingness and the ability to control the premises as a way to mitigate the penalty from cancellation to perhaps license restrictions or an, and a possible fine or suspension. Uh, that burden isn't just to show willingness that they'd like to do this, but also the ability that they can control the premises. Here it is clear that Mr. Hoffman and Ms. Woodsky, however well-intentioned, lack both the willingness and the ability to control the premises. Uh, first, they've been trying to control it since June 2017 when Mr. Hoffman directly took over and as the administrative law judge expressly found at page 19 in the proposed order, things have not gotten any better. Uh, second, uh, the changes that they have instituted have not worked. And as stated in commission precedent, Big Shots Bar and Broiler, uh, which is OLCC 09V68 from April 2010, where serious problems persistently recur even after the licensee takes measures to control the premises, the commission has held that the licensee did not demonstrate both the willingness and ability to adequately control the premises. A third, licensees here have demonstrated actually a positive unwillingness to spend what's necessary to make more changes and to do what's necessary. Specifically, staff did propose uh, a series uh, through three offers of possible restrictions um, that could be placed on the premises, including stopping serving alcohol at 12.30 a.m. Uh, and requirement as to DPSST certified extra security to patrol the parking lot. Uh, and this was rejected by the licensee as too expensive. As the LJ found at proposed order page 20, that shows a lack of willingness and ability. I don't think it's necessary to discuss the other violations unless there are any questions about them. Um, staff requests that you enter the proposed order of the administrative law judge as a final order, which means that for a history of serious and persistent problems, uh, unmitigated by willingness and ability, uh, staff requests license cancellation and non-renewal. I will now turn it over to Mr. Mills to present licensee's exceptions after which I will request that you give me a few minutes to respond to what he has to say to you before you retire to deliberate. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Schein. I may clear my throat from time to time. I've had a little trouble with my voice, but good morning. Uh, Chair Rosenbaum, members of the commission, Director Marks and Ms. Paul. Um, last time I was here, your status or at least your position in space was much more elevated uh, you've gotten seemingly more down to earth and it was kind of intimidating before even to an experienced lawyer my, like myself and so it is appreciated I'm sure for the members of the public who appear in front of you. You've also got some new equipment and uh, it's re <coughs> really very nice. Isn't that why the judges stand I think it very is. much they're higher than all of us? always up there. Um, I'm a lawyer in private practice. I've been in private practice since 1972, graduating from Alama University. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about myself uh, as it fits into the context of why I'm here arguing my client's case. Um, 
I was a licensee while I was going to license through law school. My first client was an OLCC licensee. I represented the Oregon Rostron Lodging Association since 1972, advising them mainly on, on the lottery and OLCCs. I have represented licensees in literally hundreds of administrative proceedings such as this, including history of serious and persistent problems. I currently have over 100 OLCC and lottery clients. I'm here not because we necessarily dispute some of the facts that Michael Schein uh, put before you. The facts were well documented. I'm here because uh, I want to point out to you that if you, if the, you adopt the proposed order as your final order in its present stage, that I believe that you will be opening up a new area of liability for licensees and make them liable for acts of people who are not their patrons and under who they are not over whom they have no control. Uh, I have filed a number of, of uh, exceptions. Uh, I invite you to read those exceptions. Uh, unfortunately, it's lengthy, but I believe it was necessary to show how the shift in the proposed order is going to affect the industry, not only these clients of mine, but uh, the whole industry. And I'll go through some of those incidents to tell you why. Um, the governing statute that allows the OLCC to bring a history of serious persistent problems is ORS 471-315-1C. That's the legal standard by which a history of serious and persistent problems is measured. In order to be a, an incident that is valid and that can be counted in a history of serious and persistent problems, first of all, it has to involve a, some kind of activity inside the premises. Inside the premises, the licensee is responsible for everything that goes on. That's fair enough. Uh, outside the premises, the rules change a little bit. Outside of the premises, according to the statute, they're responsible for the activities of their patrons. If those patrons are in the immediate vicinity of the premises, and if the activities of the patrons that occur in the immediate vicinity is related to the sale and service of alcohol under the exercise of the licensee's license privileges. There is nothing that I'm aware of in case law or statute that requires an OLC licensee to be responsible for anyone except a patron under those particular circumstances. Under the findings in the proposed order, if you adopt it as it is, um, there are situations which are outside the statute that I'll point, up to, point out to you. Um, the first one is a proposed finding of fact 16. And here's the fact scenario. And here again, the facts really aren't an issue. The issue is, is this something that my clients and other licensees should be held responsible for if it occurs at their premises? Uh, a suspect was found hanging around the premises. He was 18 years old. There was no evidence that he was, in, was a patron at all. He was 18. He wasn't <coughs> legally allowed to be inside the premises. There was no evidence that he had been inside the premises or that he had attempted to gain entry to the premises. It turns out that he had an outstanding warrant for his arrest and the licensee <coughs> was not aware of that outstanding warrant. In fact, they weren't aware necessarily that he was hanging around outside. The police arrested him outside and then they found illegal drugs on his person. There was no evidence of offering for sale, sale, use, distribution, exhibiting illegal drugs in the, in the immediate vicinity. There was no evidence that the, that the licensee had any inclination that this was going on. This particular incident that you're being asked to adopt in the proposed order is missing the element of a problem inside the premises. It's missing the element of a patron involved. 
and it's missing the element of activity by a patron. The licensee has never in its history <coughs> in over two years been cited for allowing illegal drunk drug sales. There's never been a dr an arrest inside their premises for possession of illegal drugs. The proposed order makes the licensee responsible for the fact situation you just listened to and counts it against them as an incident of serious and persistent problem. Next incident. A 16-year-old was found outside the premises. He had previously been trespassed from that area by the police. And when the police saw him, he was smoking a marijuana cigarette outside the premises, and he was arrested again for trespass because of the previous trespass order. Upon his arrest outside the premises, the drugs were found concealed on his premises. There was no knowledge by the licensee that he was smoking marijuana or that he possessed drugs and he was never inside the, the uh, premises. The licensee also has never been cited for sale or service to a minor or allowing a minor in an uh, unlicensed portion or a portion of the premises that was not open for uh, uh, minors to be in. <clears throat> Again, that particular finding makes the licensee and my client responsible for uh, activity that I don't feel under the statute they should be responsible for. <coughs> Another incident. The licensee, Mr. Hoffman, on his way to do some errands, noticed a large group of persons in a public alley two doors down from his business, and he called the police, as he had been advised to do by the OLCC, because he saw activity there in the alley that he didn't think there shouldn't be a gathering of people. There is no evidence that any of those people outside in the alley were patrons or had been inside the premises or attempted to gain entry to the premises. Upon the police arriving as a result of Mr. Hoffman's call, uh, they, um, <coughs> excuse me, they uh, arrested uh, the one uh, on an outstanding warrant for trespass, and he refused to leave at the direction of the officer, so they arrested him. The discovery of drugs concealed on his person was after the arrest, outside the premises. Again, the licensee did not permit any unlawful activity and should be given mitigation for the fact that he called the police. Missing elements again. No patron, nothing inside, and not related to the sale or service under the license privileges by the 16-year-old or by the people who were outside. Another incident, and here again, there's no dispute as to the facts. A witness heard a loud bang, which turns out to be gunshots, coming from the parking lot north of the premises. It's a huge one entire block, most of it a parking lot like a, a shopping center parking lot. The witness stated that they saw the gun and it was fired straight up into the air and not at anyone or anything and there was no evidence of a victim or property damage. That person was not a patron. He was not inside the premises and hadn't been inside the premises. And uh, the activity in the immediate vicinity by a non-patron was not related to the sale or service of alcohol under the exercise of the license privileges. Again, that incident is missing some elements that should be there. I think this might be the last one, but uh, the police observed a known gang member starting to come out of the premises. And there was testimony at the hearing that uh, they do not deny entry to gang members because there's not illegal to be a gang member. It's only the activity of a person that decides whether they're illegal or not. Anyway, the police saw this person coming out of the premises. He was known to be a, a gang member and it was known to have a warrant out for him. Um, there was no illegal activity of that person inside the premises, even though he was uh, a patron. 
the police were aware that he had the warrant, and when he came back outside sometime later, they arrested him for the warrant. The licensee was not aware that the person had a warrant. Uh, the activity of being in the parking lot with an outstanding warrant was not something that was related to the sale or service of their license privileges, and is again make, missing some of the elements. Okay, I'm gonna give you one more. A patron came into the premises. It was kind of funny in a way, and uh, sad but funny. A patron came into the premises and left his keys in the unlocked car. It was subsequently stolen from the parking lot. No evidence that a patron stole it from the parking lot. It was not related to any activity by the patron, except if you count the fact that you leave your keys in an unlocked car as a stupid activity that may qualify, but I don't think that's what the statute says. Again, the, the, the uh, theft was not related to the exercise of license privileges. Um, there's a couple others, but uh, I'm, I'm gonna use up the rest of my time. That the proposed order, if you adopt it in its entirety, does not include a finding that the licensee should be considered for mitigation because of the act of its security. And there are 15 incidents in which the DPSST certified security acted appropriately in taking care of patrons, stopping any fights, calling the police, etc. That should be part of the final order is the findings as to what mitigation, because mitigation is part of the statute. I didn't read the whole statute. If you, you can be, have mitigation even though there's an incident by the fact that your security takes appropriate action under the circumstances. Another fact that the proposed order does not find that was part of the evidence that I believe you should consider before you consider adopting this as a proposed order, the Rosewood Initiative, which is a couple of doors down and around the corner, had a shooting inside their premises at an event that they had leased out to people. The strip club within a block or block and a half had a fatal shooting in its parking lot uh, while my clients were licensees at uh, their premises. The apartments across the street had a fatal shooting uh, while my clients- I'm there because that goes beyond the record. Pardon me? There was no evidence put in record about the apartments? Uh, I believe there was, but you can check the record. Um, again, there's a, there's a missing element in the findings of fact that, that uh, it should show that within a half mile radius of the premises, it has a high concentration of crime and poverty not related to my client. The area around it, not connected to patrons, has experienced homeless and mentally challenged people, people sleeping in their cars in the parking lot, and the presence of vagrants and transients, some of them who drink beverages from containers and brown paper bags. Um, a couple of comments on what Mr. Shine had said. It was a long AJ, huh? <laughs> um, Mr. Hoffman, as I said, did not have any experience. He was a novice, and he got into a bad situation in a bad neighborhood. You will note that the first incident mentioned by Mr. Shine occurred within just a month or two after he came up from California and got into his new bar situation. The second one in July of 2017 also occurred just within a month. In fact, in my exceptions, I show to you that eight of the 26 uh, incidents occurred within a few months after he had moved up here. Finally, and, and the most important thing I'm asking you to do, based on the exceptions, is that you should consider my
my arguments and look at the statute and consider whether or not the incidents that I've talked about and the seven or eight others that I don't have time to cover that I put into my exception, see whether those fit inside the statute and see if you're willing to what I believe would be an expansion of the statute. I'm asking that you consider which of those fit or do not fit and if you have a final order that excludes some of the ones I've accepted to that you uh, issue a final order then look at the history of serious and persistent problems and decide whether or not a fine and or suspension would be more appropriate. One other comment, comment about the willingness. Um, yes, Mr. Shine and I went back and forth for several months on negotiating for a settlement where the client would agree to restrictions. And as it turned out, my client agreed to every restriction except the one for DPSST certification and the number of people that would be there at certain times. Those people are very expensive and it being into the bar business uh, and they realized that it wasn't economically feasible at that time. Mr. Hoffman has since gone to DPSST certification and has his certification as a concealed carry manager DPSST person and works 40 to 50 hours a week uh, up till the time of the hearing and what's on the record uh, at the uh, premises. So thank you for your consideration and again. Uh, Councilor, before we, we get it, will you, I'm sorry. Will, will you please repeat for us what you're asking us to do? Okay. I'm asking you to review the exception and I'm asking you to consider on the specific incidents that I believe do not fit within the statute. I'm asking you to consider those and if you decide they shouldn't be, throw them out look at the ones that you still feel is within the statute, then evaluate my client as to willingness and ability and whether there's actually a history of serious and persistent problems. And if you still find a history of serious and persistent problems and look at all the other factors, I'm asking that you either fine or suspend my client uh, rather than cancel their license. Okay, and before the questions start, there's 17, um, facts that you allege that were not proven. There are 4, 5, 6, 8 to 13, 15, 17, 18, 19, 22, 24, 25, and 26. How many others are there? Just to refresh my memory. If I alleged in my, are you reading from my exception? Yeah, you, yeah. You've, in your brief, you talked about 17 uh, facts that were proven outside the statute. Right. How many are inside that you're asking us to look at? It would be the remainder. And how many are those? Total of 26 that the uh, ALJ found. Nine. Uh, excluding, because you're the one who brought this up, excluding the 17, there's 26 others. That we're, no, 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 no. There's a total of 26. So if you had 17, that would be nine. Nine. Okay. Nine. That was not clear to me, uh, even when I read this thing. Okay. Thank you. By the way, thank you for the opportunity to appear here. Any questions? No, they were answered the, those are my questions. Yeah. So thank you for clarification. Mr. Chairman, if I may briefly in rebuttal. Sure. Uh, I believe that uh, with all due respect, what Mr. Mills is asking this commission to do is to go back and retrench long-standing commission precedent on history of serious and persistent problems. And I mean that in these particular ways. Uh, first off, he's asking uh, that you abandon the long stated presumption that persons who come to the premises are there because the licensee has, is related to the sale of alcohol. It's related to the license. Uh, to quote from La Brisa, Way back in 1992, Final Order 91-L-037, the Commission has found that the phrase related to the sale or service of alcohol does not require showing that the involved patrons purchased 
was served or consumed alcohol in the licensed premises. Rather, the commission presumes that persons are coming to the premises because the licensee has a license and for the purpose of consuming alcoholic liquor. So that's a, a legal mistake that is made, I believe, by Mr. Mills that would allow him to exclude some of these incidents where there's not direct proof that a person was a patron in the sense of having purchased or consumed alcohol. Uh, secondly, uh, there's other important precedent. I want to bring your attention to Don's dugout, OLCC 12-V-065, May 2013. Uh, it involved a shots fired incident. The licensee objected that there was no proof that the person who shot who fired the shot, which was in the parking lot outside, much like many incidents at the <coughs> speakeasy here, uh, there was no proof that person was a patron. Actually, in the March incident, there was direct proof that the person who fired the shots that went into the apartment building had been inside the premises immediately preceding doing that, and so was a patron. But on the other, another incident where they sprayed the front of the building with gunfire, there wasn't direct proof that that person had been a patron, rather that he was shooting at a person who was a patron inside the premises. But regardless, what Don's dugout says is, as for the May 20, May 20, 2012 shots fired incident, though there is no evidence that the shooter was a patron of the premises, the shooting occurred in the premises parking lot and involved persons hanging out in the parking lot. Under the circumstances presented, and given the nature of licensee's business, an on-premises sales license, which is the same as the speakeasy, quote, it is reasonable to conclude that persons congregating in the premises parking lot when the premises is open for business are there to patronize the premises. This shooting incident placed patrons and persons assembled in an area under the licensee's control at serious risk of injury or death. For these reasons, the shooting in licensee's parking lot is considered related to licensee's sale or service of alcohol. And, you know, these same arguments that Mr. Mills is making now were made to the ALJ, were briefed by both sides, including citations to your authority, and were rejected by the ALJ because they do not accord with the law established by this commission. And uh, it would, contrary to Mr. Mills suggesting that it would require a great expansion of our precedent, to allow these incidents to be counted, it's exactly the other way around. It would require a significant contracting and change to our precedents to exclude the incidents that he's asking to exclude. Uh, there's another basis on which he, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, there's another basis on which he's talking about excluding, and, and this gets to uh, one of the incidents where he said, where he said that we hadn't proved um, Let's see. No, actually, what I want to say is that if you look at one of the significant problems here, and we brief this to the ALJ, is that persons loitering in front of the premises is itself a kind of behavior within the language of the statute, which creates a risk to public safety. They're targets for shootings. They're catalysts for fighting. They're the location for drug sales. They're the solicitors for prostitution and harassment of passers-by, all of which was proven by the evidence. It disrupts the lawful uses of the area around the premises by neighboring businesses, is therefore squarely within the reach of ORS 471-315-1C, which includes without limitation excessive noise, public drunkenness, fights, altercations, harassment, drug sales, alcohol and related litter, trespassing, and public urination. So, all, so the, exactly what's happening at the speakeasy is exactly what this statute that the legislature passed is intended to remedy. Chair Rosenbaum. Commissioner. I have a question. Um, Mr. Mills. Mr. Mills. So the business is surrounded by a very large parking lot. Is that correct? I'm sorry. The building is surrounded by a very large parking lot. Not surrounded. It's in one corner of a very large parking lot. There's a small parking lot, and this is in the record, small parking lot in front of with eight to ten spaces maybe. Okay. And then around the corner is a huge parking lot with a couple of hundred spaces. Uh, and usually the record refers to the parking lot in front or the Sukasa park parking lot, which is the one to the north, I believe. 
So how much area, area? Because part of your, as I understand your your conversation, has to deal with the activities that are occurring within the the parking lot. How much of that area do, would you propose that your client should be in control of? Uh, the the parking lot in front of the premises, for sure. Okay. Um, there is um, maybe seven or eight parking spaces immediately around the corner out of view of the front door of the, my client's place Right. that clients, re patrons regularly park in. I would consider that also. But the rest of the... Is it anything in back? Pardon? Anything behind, any parking behind the building? No. Okay. Okay. And then your argument would also be is, is that... 17 of the incidents that occurred of, of the total or, were not patrons at any time or, or shouldn't be considered patrons. Well, I don't remember the exact argument for each, but each one of them was missing one of the elements that I feel was necessary. It was either not related to the sale or service of alcohol, did not involve uh, an activity inside the premises by a patron, or did not in involve an illegal activity by the patron in the immediate vicinity outside. I, I can't tell you the distinction on the other six that I believe are, are probably, or nine, excuse me, that I believe are probably valid. Okay, I'm gonna, of course we're gonna be rereading it, but I'm just trying to get your definition of a patron. Well, anybody inside the premises is a patron. Mm -hmm. Anybody who has been inside and leaves is a patron in the immediate vicinity. Okay. Anybody who is coming to and tries to enter in, if they're of legal age, is a patron. That's, I don't dispute Mr. Shine's characterization of what the law says in that regard. My exceptions are to areas that I think are outside those parameters in the statute and outside of what he's laid down as past commission precedent. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Redwell. Any other questions? I, I uh, um, you don't have to read it. I, I, under the finding of facts, uh, fact number 53, let me read it to you. In response to ongoing disturbances, licensee instituted a set of house rules for patrons of the licensed premises that read, one, must be minimum 25 with valid ID. Two, all persons and purses, uh, purses subject to search. Three, no weapons. Four, no hoods. Five, no backpacks. Six, no saggy pants. Seven, smoking in front of the building only. And eight, one drink minimum per person. When were those house rules put into effect? Shortly after, well, within six months, of him taking over and actually being in charge. And the smoking situation in front, uh, the patrons would go outside and smoke on the steps, take a few steps down and be in the parking lot. That became a problem and the OLCC inspector uh, asked them, keep the people from loitering in the front that are your patrons that are smoking. So they spent, I think the record shows over $2,000 to build a smoking enclosure off to the side overlooking the Sukasa parking lot. And that's where their patrons now go to smoke out of sight of anyone in the front who may be around the front that's not a patron, out of sight of the people in the big parking lot. Now, uh, what I'm asking is take the 26 violations, okay? Out of those 26, was these house rules in effect before, after, in the media? What, what year did you put those house rules into effect? In 2017, sometime probably within six months. Six months of what? Of, of him coming up in June of two... Of purchasing. So Sorry. were these house rules in effect at the time that these violations took place, or were these house rules in effect after the violations took place? Uh, both. Some of them took place after the house rules were in effect, 
and some of them took place before <clears throat> the House rules were in effect. Chair Rosenbaum, uh, I believe the record would show that these House rules were put in effect approximately July 2017. July 2017. And, Correct. And so when were the four additional cameras added to the facility? One outside and three inside. I'm trying to do uh, this by memory. I'm not exactly sure about that. I, I would say about the house rules to go back to it, most of the violations are after the date they were put into effect and the proposed finding of fact from the ALJ is that these rules were inconsistently enforced which well, is part of the problem. I'm trying to understand. I, I, um, you, you, you added another four cameras to the facility, three of them inside, one of them outside. Was that at the same time that the house rules went into effect? No, it was subsequent to that. The, the findings of fact as to when the various things were implemented uh, are generally true and consistent in the proposed order. That, that tells you when things were put into effect. My comment would be that none of the violations that I'm aware of were as a result of somebody not enforcing or following the house rules. Uh, who's that somebody? Pardon? You said somebody. Who's the somebody? Uh, uh, that, the, that, the a effect patron, that a patron, or, or excuse me, that the licensee did not enforce the house rules. None of the violations that I think we're talking about are as a result of the licensee not enforcing those house rules. In other words, the under 25 or the no backpack or uh, the fact that they did not or did not enforce those house rules, I don't think has any relationship to whether or not a violation occurred because those house rules were not enforced. Well, well I'm, I, I just want to pursue this for one second. Go ahead. So maybe you can explain this to me. You set a group of house rules. Did you do that because the OLCC required you to do it or just because of all of the pr prior incidences? I, my client did it because he felt that the, the experience under the prior owner and the type of clientele he had needed to have some house rules. There weren't any house rules to my knowledge before. So we started excluding people uh, who did not have, who were under, 20, under 25. No backpacks because sometimes people sneak things in. Checking for weapons, no weapons allowed. He did all those things because after the first few months he was there, he realized that he had a problem bar and he started cleaning it up. Any other questions? Okay. The commissioners will now go into chambers for deliberations on contested cases pursuant to ORS 192.690 sub 1. Uh, once we're complete, we'll then return to the open session and make decisions on the contested cases. And by the way, I just want uh, you to know that this commission is precluded from discussing this case in any way, shape, or form with each other beforehand. When we go back there, it's the first time we will have a discussion on this. I matter. understand that, and I think that's a good practice. Thank, Thank you. you. Commission is back in session. Commissioner Pally. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair. In the matter of the full on-premises sales license held by KRH Hospitality LLC doing business as Speakeasy Lounge, I move to adopt the proposed order and to issue a final order canceling and refusing to renew the license. Commissioner Kern? Yes. Commissioner Floyd? Yes. Commissioner Harper? Yes. Commissioner Melinas? Yes. Commissioner Posick? Yes. Commissioner Aval? Yes. Chair Rosenbaum. Yes. Order is adopted. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Oh, let's do alcohol violations. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Oh. It is good afternoon. Just oh barely. God. Yeah. Oh, no. this is good afternoon. Good shot. 
Good afternoon, Chair and members of the Commission. Today we have six alcohol violations uh, for you to consider. The agenda does show seven. I wanted just to remind you that uh, the seventh one, how he's on front, has been removed from the agenda. And with that, I can take any questions. Excuse me. Hi. Hello. Who are you? <laughs> oh, come on. Uh, my name is Marianne. I am a uh, case presenter with APMP. Thank you. She runs the place. I. Any questions? Take the roll, Commissioner. Oh, we almost made it. <laughs> I move to ratify the six stipulated no. settlement agreements as proposed by staff. Commissioner Curran. Yes. Commissioner Floyd. Yes. Commissioner Harper. Yes. Commissioner Molinas. Yes. Commissioner Palsic. Yes. Commissioner Raval. Yes. Sir Rosenbaum. Yes. Next, we have eight marijuana violation stipulated settlement agreements for your consideration, and I can take questions on those as well. It says six on How many? here. Turn it over. We should have eight on the agenda. Right. Eight. So four? There are eight. Oh, it's just four. For marijuana. marijuana. That's the agenda over. There's eight. There's eight. There's eight. There's eight. Okay, the other one on the back. So there's six? My error. There's eight. 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 Oh, there my eight. error on the motions agenda. Two that swap over to here. Got it. They didn't have a little bullet. Exactly. Yep. No, I was showing them where they were. Oh. I can't care. Chair Rosenbaum? I move to ratify the eight stipulated settlements agreements as proposed by staff. Any further discussion? Yeah. Commissioner Kern? Yes. Commissioner Floyd? Yes. Commissioner Harper? Yes. Commissioner Molinas? Yes. Commissioner Pasek? Yes. Commissioner Aval? Yes. Chair Rosenbaum? Yes. I think we set a record. Woo. Mm -hmm. And then we have one more, which is a licensing stipulated settlement agreement for your consideration. Chair, I move to ratify. Do you have any questions? I just have one. Oh, you have a question on that? You guys are, are comfortable. You obviously reviewed it, but you're totally comfortable with this given the last. I mean, it sounds like it's a different um, different sort of operation, but I know that we we saw this group before and, and staff was comfortable with the as it is. Or Is there any background you can kind of give on this? Yeah. Staff is comfortable. Um, in for several reasons. One, um, the prior licensee is no longer is not going to be involved in the current or the proposed business. We recognize that this is the son of the biz of the prior owner. However, we do have a specific requirement in there that the prior licensee not be on the property or be involved with the business. So that takes care of that concern. Second, this proposed business is significantly different from the prior one in terms of the types of things that they will be doing, the types of patrons we would expect to see there. And we have some restrictions put into place for, um, about when and how much alcohol can be served on the, the premises, which are the things that give us the comfort um, to be able to bring this to you. Okay. I just wanted to put that out. Sure. I, I have this, the same question also. I, I see... a. Uh, not a phenomenon, but I see a transition from these type of operators going to a car type of um, situation. And do we have a history of uh, when businesses change and go into the um, either training or skills in regards to the poker operation and then serving alcohol at the same time? Or, or is this pretty much a new business for us here at the commission? I would need to double check with licensing to see if they're seeing a trend at APMP. I'm not aware of any trend. Okay, and then <clears throat> the chair, we just talked about this case a little bit ago in recess about a, a business closing down and then a new business opening up. And this this scenario is, is um, it doesn't change the people around the area, 
it pretty much hopefully changes the, the clientele to come into the business, if I understand us correctly. And that's Correct. why we've accepted this type of uh, order and made <coughs> this uh, settlement agreement for uh, the son. Correct. Okay, so has there is there any change in square footage or any change of anything else outside of this building? Or everything else remains the same in regards to what we saw uh, in regards to the schematics of this practice? Not that I'm aware of, but the case, Michael Shine was the case presenter on this. Um, I can ask him to come up and ask, answer that. Thank you, Marianne. Uh, Chair Rosenbaum, Commissioner Harper, Commissioner is up. The significant thing about this settlement, first off, is that there is a restriction on the proposed license to be issued, which cuts off alcohol sales at 10 p.m. Uh, that's an entirely different business model. Previously, <coughs> this was run as a nightclub, uh, and it went until 2.30 a.m., and uh, a lot of the bad stuff, if you will, happened in those late hours, especially from midnight on. Um, now, uh, it's not required that this operator be closed. Uh, they're, they're going into a social gaming uh, type of business, and I know you asked about that. Uh, and we have some experience, but it's somewhat limited experience uh, with the social gaming business model. However, we've consulted in connection with preparing this settlement um, with Oregon Lottery and got information uh, through that channel. We also uh, know that they're required to be um, licensed by the city of Portland in order to have a social gaming license, and there are some very strict restrictions on what they can and cannot do. And we have kind of piggybacked on that regulatory scheme by making it one of the restrictions that they do obtain their certification or licensing uh, or permit, whatever it is exactly, from the city of Portland for the social gaming uh, and that they uh, maintain that and they not have any social gaming except pursuant to valid compliance with that permit. So with the early alcohol sale, the completely different uh, business model, we're comfortable that even though this is the same square footage, most of it is going to be devoted uh, to a restaurant, mm. uh, and it's going to be a, a restaurant, and they're going to have standard alcohol service until 10 p.m., and uh, then the social gaming aspect, we believe, that uh, is going to draw in a completely different clientele than the nightclub drew. And, and, and final question, Chair. Yes, sir. What, what was the time difference from when we took the license away to this new uh, operator opened up his business? Uh, it was the effective date of the final order was January 2019. Right, okay. So we're talking 11 Eight months, months 11 later. 11 months. Yep. All right. Yeah. Sure. I remember Mr. Fong, Sammy. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Does his son realize that if his dad shows up, he's going to have serious problems in the future? Well, he's competently represented by counsel uh -huh. who should have explained that to him because it's there are two restrictions that pertain to that, uh, and their violation of either one would be a Category 1 and therefore cancelable offense. So I can't, I mean, other than to say he should realize it, yes. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any further questions? No. no. Take the roll, please. Oh, yeah. I'm, I move to ratify the stipulated settlement agreements for a trio club as proposed by staff. Commissioner Kern. Yes. Commissioner Floyd. Yes. Commissioner Harper. Yes. Commissioner Melitis. Yes. Commissioner Posset. Yes. Commissioner Oval. Yes. Chair Rosenbaum. No. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Marijuana. Kelly, are you up? Nope, no. we're doing a briefing on emergency <coughs> motion to stay. Oh. All sorts of different marijuanas yeah. in this world. <laughs>
Hello again. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Rosenbaum, members of the commission. For the record, my name is Kelly Rout, Director of the Administrative Policy and Process Division. I've been asked to provide an update on the temporary rule enacted to prohibit flavored vapor products and the motion to stay that was filed a few weeks ago. As you know, on October 11th, the commission adopted temporary rules to implement the governor's executive order on flavored vapor products. On October 29th, about two and a half weeks later, a marijuana wholesaler petitioned the Court of Appeals for judicial review of those rules, claiming it was adversely affected by the rule. A uh, petitioner requested an emergency motion to stay the implementation of the rule banning flavored vapor products, but they did not request a stay of the rule pertaining to compliance and audit testing. Um, on November 1st, the OLCC through the DOJ Appellate Division filed a response objecting to that motion. Um, two weeks later, on November 14th, the Court of Appeals did grant a motion to stay um, enforcement of the flavored vapor ban rule. Um, after considering the petitioner's likelihood of success on judicial review, the likelihood of irreparable harm to petitioner absent a stay, and the likelihood of harm to the public if a stay is granted, the court concluded that those factors weighed in favor of granting a stay. Um, the next day, on, October, on November 15th, OLCC filed a request for reconsideration, um, arguing that the petitioner was unlikely to prevail on the merits and the balance of harms weighed in favor of, of upholding the ban. Um, however, um, the following day, on Tuesday, November 19th, the chief judge of the Oregon Court of Appeals denied a request for reconsideration. So at this point in time, the rule prohibiting flavored vapor products is not in effect pending judicial review, um, but the rule allowing OLCC to request additional testing is in effect. Um, the <coughs> Court of Appeals will set a briefing schedule for the underlying motion for judicial review. Um, those, that briefing schedule has not been set, so I'm available to answer any questions. I don't know what to ask. I mean, anybody have anything? It's, it's a head scratcher. What can we say? Uh, money over health. It's disappointing. It's disappointing. Yeah. Thank you. Steve, you got anything you want to add? No. <laughs> okay. Thanks, yeah. Kelly. All right. Thank you. It's Dana? To the extent that we have updates in the future, we will let you know. But that's oh, what we know right now. Well, yeah. of course. Yeah. Thank you. Stay. Yay. Thank you. Yeah. Commissioners, um, for the record, I'm Danica Hipsman, policy advisor for the agency, and I have with me today uh, policy analyst um, Anthony Galtoski to discuss the Center for Disease Control's recent report of November 7th, 2019, regarding their investigation into the causes or cause of the national outbreak of e-cigarette or vaping product use associated lung injury, also known as e-valley. So I'm actually going to have a copy for you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. I'm in trouble now. Boy, there's an awful lot of PhDs on this. There is. So, and I'll let Anthony take it from here. So I'm Anthony Galtoski, and um, I'm just going to go over some of the key findings from this slide. 86% uh, of the tested patients reported THC use. Analysis of THC-containing product samples <clears throat> excuse me, by the FDA and state public health laboratories have identified potentially harmful constituents in these products, such as vitamin E acetate, medium-chain triglyceride oil, which is also known as MCT oil, and other lipids. Inhalation of vitamin E acetate might impair lung function, and vitamin E acetate was detected in all of the tested lung tissue samples from Evali patients. Currently, the CDC has the following statement on their website. And as you can see that the CDC has identified vitamin E acetate as a chemical of concern among people with Evali. It is important to note that apart from the recent investigation of lung illnesses related to vaping, there is other research with the C which the CDC cites indicating inhalation of vitamin E acetate may impair lung function. Given the evidence provided by the CDC regarding vitamin E acetate's harmful effects and detection in the lung tissue samples tested after individuals reported THC vaping, staff feel it is appropriate to prohibit vitamin E acetate from being used in cannabis vaping products made and sold in Oregon. 
The commission already has the authority to take this action. OLCC under ORS 475B-232 subsection 2 can prohibit licensees from selling a marijuana item that contain injurious or adulterated ingredients. In rule, OLCC defines adulterated to mean, in part, a foreign, inferior, poisonous, or deleterious substance or ingredient that renders the marijuana item injurious to health. And this is found in OAR 845-025-1015, subsection 2. OLCC has several rules prohibiting the manufacture and retail sale of adulterated products. And under most circumstances, violation of these rules could be treated as a cancelable offense. Staff believe that given the CDC report, it is appropriate to consider vitamin E acetate as an adulterant as defined in current rule. Staff are seeking input from the commission on whether it agrees that vitamin E acetate should be considered as an adulterant in the manufacture of cannabis products with vitamin E acetate or the sale of any product with vitamin E acetate should be prohibited in Oregon's cannabis market. It is important to keep in mind that while the CDC's report is a vital step forward in understanding the nature and cause of valley injuries and deaths across the country, it should not be treated as the definitive answer to the crisis, and particularly not for Oregon. As we previously reported, the illnesses and deaths in Oregon have ties to cannabis vaping products purchased in legal, licensed retail shops. But OLCC has not approved any vaping product which expressly contains vitamin E acetate as an ingredient to date. Therefore, there is no evidence at this time that vitamin E acetate is being used as an ingredient in Oregon's legal cannabis vaping products. Additionally, based on the information published by the CDC, no Oregon data is included in its findings. Specifically, none of the lung fluid samples were from Oregon cases. As of November 13, 2019, 2,172 cases of Uvalde have been reported to the CDC from 49 states, the District of Columbia, and two U.S. territories. 42 deaths have been confirmed in 24 states in the District of Columbia. In Oregon, 18 cases have been reported, two of which have resulted in death. The majority of reported illnesses and deaths have ties to cannabis use. As both the national and state level investigations continue to unfold, we expect a great deal more information will be learned, which could ultimately lead to the regulatory requirement and consumer demand for safer products in this state. Staff will continue to keep the commission appraised as this public health investigation progresses and may make similar recommendations in the future about other substances as more information is discovered. And just for clarity, staff plans to include a specific reference to vitamin E acetate as a prohibited substance in future rulemaking. Chair Rosenbaum, for the record again, Danica Hipsman. Um, fortunately, Oregon, unlike maybe other states, is kind of well positioned with our, both our statutory authority and rulemaking authority already to prohibit this. We have rules that define um, adulterated substances, and we feel like this evidence supports a conclusion that vitamin E acetate is an adulterant. Um, for more um, clarification, though, we are proposing just a motion for the commission to take up just simply to concur with staff's recommendation that it be considered an adulterant. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Sure. Yeah, if I may. Are there other states that have already uh, taken up vitamin E acetate? Yes, there have. Uh, Washington recently prohibited vitamin E acetate expressly as well. Right. Like New York, too, but I wasn't sure. And Colorado has yeah. recently, oh, there's, too. There's a few of them already. Yeah. Oh, so. Sure. Did I hear so you request ask you for a motion? Yes, Chair. Okay. Anybody want to give a motion? Chair. Commissioner? Uh, I make a motion to concur with staff in regards to the... If you wanted, we proposed the language on the screen if you wanted to just read it. Uh, Thank Commissioner you. Harper. Uh, to concur with the staff's recommendation that based on recent findings from the Center of Disease Control and other evidence, vitamin E acetate qualifies as an adulterated adulterant in cannabinoid vaping products and under the commission's authority, it should be prohibited from being sold or used in the manufacturing of products intended for inhalation in the Oregon cannabis market. Okay, so before we vote on it, uh, what, what effect does this have in this? Once we vote on this, go through the next step. 
Chair Rosenbaum, this is really more of a procedural, just, just a, a procedural. It really is not the commission or... taking action um, because we already have the authority to do what we're doing. We're, we're basically just asking that the commission uh, affirmatively agree that our interpretation is correct. Okay. Mr. Chair, I have a question on that. Though. Sure. Did I hear correctly? It, so far, it's not used in the state. Not to our knowledge. Products, no. Not to your knowledge, right? It's out of abundance of caution then that we're looking at this this way. Correct. Excellent. Well. Commissioner Kern. Yes. Commissioner Floyd. Yes. Commissioner Harper. Yes. Commissioner Miletus. Yes. Commissioner Pasek. Yes. Commissioner Revolve. Yes. Chair Rosenbaum. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. All right. Before we adjourn, Steve, Sorry. staff report on alcohol we... delivery. Sorry. Yeah. I... yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just looking for uh, the door. For a moment here, just to, this might not be the only uh, uh, caution we have, but Abundance of caution. Um, we may, you know, keep looking at future phone testing to figure out how to do it. Uh, and Amanda represented us down at the legislature just on Monday. There was a discussion about development of a reference lab by uh, the Oregon Department of Agriculture. So one of the important things that we have here is not just uh, knowing what we don't know, but also testing for it. Sure. Uh -huh. Excellent. This is the presentation that says, get ready, it's coming. <laughs> it be? Yeah. yeah. So good afternoon, commissioners, Chair Rosenbaum. I am the Devin Morales uh, Statewide Liquor Licensing Technician. This is Dan Croy, Operations and Policy Analyst. And we just want to thank you all so much for letting us come here today and talk to you about the exciting topic of alcohol delivery. Uh, it's a little bit lighter than some of the most recent topics we've covered here today, and there's a lot going on in this area. Uh, the focus of the presentation will be on the way alcohol delivery is currently regulated in the state, as well as some proposed uh, changes or modifications to the way alcohol delivery is regulated here in <coughs> Oregon. And really just for some context, we'll kind of go through the way alcohol delivery is, what's going on with that around the country. So uh, this first slide just gives you a high-level overview of the, uh, what is currently allowed with respect to alcohol delivery here in the state. Several of our licensees already have the privilege to deliver malt beverages, wine, and cider to Oregon consumers, and those licensees are listed here. In addition to those license types, also direct shipper permit holders are eligible to deliver to Oregon consumers, and those are folks outside of Oregon who apply for this permit and then ship to consumers in the state. And in addition to that delivery privilege, they also can actually receive orders for malt beverages, wine, and cider remotely. And what that means is through phone or through mobile application or um, website that they operate themselves as a business. And in addition to that, um, the privilege of delivering alcohol to consumers on the next day after the order is received comes automatically with those licenses or that permit. And if they'd like to deliver on the same day an order is received, they actually have to go through an additional privilege approval process. Um, the requirements around same day are, are different from those in terms of volume and hours uh, compared to the next day delivery. They're more complex. And so it requires this sort of additional privilege to go along with that. Finally, the last kind of pillar of the way alcohol delivery is currently regulated in the state is that uh, these businesses, these eligible businesses, can actually conduct those deliveries themselves or use what's called an approved for hire carrier. And in the state right now, we have about 70 approved for hire carriers listed. They run the gamut from UPS and FedEx to Uber Eats to an individual driver of Uber Eats to Bob's Bicycle Delivery. It's, it's a whole bunch of different operators. The approval process is extremely straightforward. Uh, they just get approved for life. There's no renewal. There's no permit or anything. It's just a straight approval. And it essentially allows them to come in after a transaction is completed between a business and a consumer and pick up the alcohol from the business and then just take it to the consumer. So that's the extent of their ability to be a participant in that, in that process. So uh, over the last couple of years, some issues have come up with the, with the way that alcohol delivery is regulated in the state. And so these are some, some of the primary issues that have been raised. First of all, uh, distilled liquor actually cannot be, as of right now, <laughs> ordered remotely and then delivered to a consumer, which means that uh, people have to go into a store, purchase in person, 
And then they can elect to have it delivered, but you know, it's after that in-person purchase. And so that's something that's putting distilled liquor at a competitive disadvantage with the other beverage alcohol categories in the state and, and frankly, putting the state at a disadvantage in terms of revenue. Uh, so that's an issue that, that has been raised. And then also the there are third parties who would like to offer and a lot of our businesses would like to use the services for facilitation or processing of transactions and sales for alcohol. They, they offer these marketplace platforms. Um, examples are Drizzly, Uber Eats, Postmates, Instacart, those kinds of operators. They have great technology that a lot of businesses would like to rely on to access customers and kind of make the process of ordering alcohol more seamless. But their ability to operate in the marketplace right now in Oregon is, is kind of in, in a gray area. And so that's creating confusion for, for staff and industry. Uh, and then finally, right now, our uh, ability to sanction those four higher carriers I mentioned earlier is, is fairly limited. Uh, we can revoke the approval, but there's nothing in rule or law that prevents them from turning around the next day and then applying for the same approval again. Uh, so that creates uh, risk for the state in terms of if there's a delivery to a minor or visibly intoxicated person, we don't have a lot of control over those parties as of right now. So just to quickly touch on what has been going on in, with the legislature and this concept, uh, in the 2019 session, Representative Margaret Doherty actually introduced a bill, HB 2523, to allow for retail sales agents to, to deliver distilled liquor and accept remote orders for distilled liquor uh, and then deliver it to consumers. And she was motivated um, by some constituents in her district who actually, they had mobility issues and they were unable to easily access the stores in their district because of their mobility issues and you know wanted that option. And when she started digging into it more, she, she thought it was unusual that marijuana retailers were able to deliver marijuana to Oregon consumers and, and not also distilled liquor, you know, not having that path was something that was a little incongruous to her. So she was motivated by that. And that's where HB, HB 2523 came from, which was later kind of morphed into a second bill. And that second bill uh, involved an additional concept, which was to create a better oversight system or scheme for permitting those third party entities that deliver alcohol to Oregon consumers. Uh, the bill actually ended up dying in committee at the end of session because there were some drafting issues with it, but Representative Doherty has picked it up again for the 2020 session and she's working very actively with stakeholders, the commission, to really get a good draft um, and, and something that everybody is in support of. And so uh, this next slide talks about a working draft that we actually already have, um, and there will be a work group, work group going through that draft a little bit later, and I'll talk about that toward the end of this, but there are five key elements to the working uh, bill. And so the first would allow for that remote ordering and delivery of distilled liquor between our retail sales agents and consumers in the state. Uh, the second piece is to authorize the commission to work with likely a third party to develop some kind of an online shopping portal for distilled spirits. And uh, that's more down the road, but this is kind of planting the seed for that for the future. Uh, in addition, it would look at our current definition of activities qualifying as a sale of alcohol and create some exceptions to that to accommodate these third-party transaction facilitators in, in a narrow way to allow them to assist our businesses and assist consumers um, in the transaction processing and, and kind of make that easier for everyone. In addition to that, uh, th there is a kind of new concept in this version of the bill, and that is that any individual conducting a delivery of distilled liquor would actually need to get a service permit. And that would be relying primarily on our existing service permit scheme adding a, a module for training um, related to deliveries. And so that's kind of a newer concept that's coming forward. And then lastly, it would give the commission a, a penalty authority, civil penalty authority over the employers of those uh, delivery agents, those third party uh, individuals, because otherwise we, you know, they wouldn't have the permit. So this would give us an option for addressing violations carried out by their by their agents, essentially. So, um, Steve, on on I wake up 
<laughs> to uh, authorize the OLCC to contract for, develop, and implement, and maintain a system for ordering and delivery of distilled liquor on behalf of agents? What? That's discretionary to us. So. That's, that's discretionary to us so that we would have the opportunity, if we wanted to, to contract for a common platform that all agents could utilize uh, for the uh, purposes of consumers looking up liquor online and then uh, facilitate the delivery if well, we choose gonna... if we choose to do so. So would it be through the agents, the individual agents? Uh, the statute allows it currently to go through <laughs> the agents uh, itself directly. So agents so would be agents able would the... to do their own cool. delivery. Um, but if we put together a service that um, uh, commercialized our offerings for the public to see, that all agents could use, utilize as a platform uh, for, you know, get online, see what we have at OLCC, they order, it goes to their agent, their agent makes the delivery. Uh, we don't have to do that. This doesn't require that. This allows us to do that. Yeah, but we should be thinking about that right now. We mm -hmm. are. Yeah. I mean, it yes. has to be built in right now. Yes. Uh, yeah, this is essentially planting to see the seed for that so that we can transition to something more centralized in the future, but at the same time allow more immediately those uh, retail stores to actually provide the online ordering and delivery to consumers. So it's sort of a looking at right now and looking at the future, too. So this slide uh, actually has some pretty interesting information on it, and it's uh, a couple of surveys were completed in 2019. NABCA completed a survey, survey, and we also completed a survey ahead of the NCSLA Central Western Regional Conference in September. Um, so NABCA's survey asked all of the control jurisdictions to answer some questions about the way alcohol delivery was regulated in those jurisdictions. And then our, our NCSLA uh, survey essentially asked a lot of the same questions. And so there were uh, 16 unique respondents between the two surveys. 13 of those do allow for some form of remote ordering and delivery of alcohol. Uh, and it really is geographically all over the place. You know, it's Montgomery County in Maryland, it's Kansas, Missouri, Wyoming, Iowa, Oregon, Washington, California. It's all over the place. Um, and so we've got, I think there were eight jurisdictions that allow for remote ordering and delivery of distilled liquor. Three of those are control jurisdictions. Um, so Iowa, Michigan, and Wyoming all allow for remote ordering and delivery of distilled liquor right now. Uh, six allow for third parties to facilitate those transactions. So like Drizzly to come in and assist with that transaction processing. Uh, 10 allow for some form of third party delivery. Five have a requirement that you have a permit or something to that effect in order to actually be a third party delivering entity. And every single one of them does it differently. So it's very complicated across the country, um, but there are some consistencies. And uh, it's certainly, it's, it, you know, there's a significant uptick, which is the next slide gets into the fact that alcohol delivery is, is trending, to use a millennial term. Uh, there is a, a lot of activity in, in this respect around the country. Diving into the data on alcohol delivery, people really just want to take advantage of the convenience economy to purchase alcohol. And in those jurisdictions where that has been allowed, a lot of businesses are, are seeing increases in revenue. Um, so, you know, wine makes up the largest of those sector uh, of those categories. And that's largely because of a U.S. Supreme Court case in 2005, the Granholm case that really kind of opened the floodgates for interstate shipments of wine. Um, but as you know, other states are starting to allow for distilled liquor to be delivered to consumers there, is, there are increases in that category as well. Um, and then the third kind of key element affecting this increase in uh, remote ordering and delivery is, is just these, these uh, third-party aggregate, uh, aggregators, the tech platforms coming into the marketplace and really um, shepherding you know, that process through in those states. But it, you know, a lot of the states, in, in looking at those survey results, they're being very careful and measured in the way they're allowing for the third parties to 
um, enter the marketplace and and facilitate those transactions. So I think the state of Oregon is interested in taking a, a cautious approach with those actors as well. And the last slide here just gets into some some of the next steps. Uh, so. You know, working with Representative Doherty, we have a work group set up for early January, a work group meeting, and, you know, it's a variety of stakeholders, the commission, her office, uh, meeting to go over that existing working draft bill and getting everyone's perspectives and feedback on that. Uh, in the meantime, we're looking at completing the fiscal impact analysis and some of the highlights as of right now, or we're looking at the possibility of an additional 20,000 service permittees in the state. Um, so, you know, there's there's some staffing needs associated with that and, and system upgrades potentially. So we're kind of evaluating that piece right now. And, uh, you know, there's also some work being done on figuring out what the revenue impact would be of, of allowing for the remote ordering and delivery of distilled liquor. You can't do that. I mean, you just can't do 20,000 new permits if that's the case. And unless you get the, the systems in, you're going to be bogged down. There's just no way you're going to do it. Well, Mr. Chairman, this is on our ex existing system. So we yeah, do a considerable amount. It will take more staff work uh, uh, for processing, but we do believe we can service this off the existing server permit um, side. No, I have, I understand no. that, but if you don't, if, yeah. if we don't get this done, you're not getting it done. Yeah. It's as yep. simple as all right. We've got to put those resources together, and there's no doubt that uh, those systems do not perform uh, efficiently as we'd like them. Yeah, it's all it's all going into the analysis of this issue and and the fiscal impact that's being put together, uh, and then the last piece is that if you know it's we're looking at a 2021 effective date likely, and so um, you know staff would need to start working on rulemaking pretty quickly if if it's moving forward. Chair Rosenbaum. Yeah. Do we have any idea as to what the uh, cost of this type of service will be and who will bear their costs? Oh, of course the consumer will bear their costs. But do we know what kind of fees you're going to be looking at? So, uh, you know, each entity that would come online for this would have its own system for de determining what the fees would be uh, in terms of who's paying. Are you talking about for the state, if the state set up a portal or if... No, um, if it's for the consumer to contact, you know, sure. XYZ licensee. So, yeah, again, each of those uh, third-party facilitators, they oftentimes set up a, a delivery fee and then a service fee. And, and you know, they, they use things like surge pricing. So, um, and depending on distance, there are a number of variables that, that they consider um, in determining the, the price for delivery. So, I think it could be anything from a few dollars to $10. Um, sure. Thank you. I think, and to kind of piggyback on on um, uh, Commissioner Raval's comment, I, I think the the regulatory scheme that gets set, the licensing scheme that gets set, really in a lot of ways determines that. Because if we're going to allow like a, a third party or, or a contract with a third party, and and it's it, it's really all over. So Frank, I'm, my only comment on it is I I as much as we can be involved in the discussion to that before, we're happy to. Show up, but it really the the work that gets done here, I think, sets the precedent and really determines a lot of that. And I think it, it has implications for the agents. It has implications for um, the permittees, and because uh, yeah, I mean, these uh, third party carriers typically, if you look at their revenue, they don't make money. Like Uber and those guys, they lose money. Like so, if you look at it, it's uh, it is all over the map where this this could end up or the fees could be on it. So it's exciting, interesting, but yeah. Um, Sorry for the two cents, but yeah, it's, it is, uh, uh, we don't know what it could cost yet. Uh, Devin? Yes. So would our licensees, so let me get my bearings here. So our licensees, that would it would behoove them then to, um, they would need to get an additional license uh, licensing, correct? Like an, an off, so you've got a full on-premises licensee. They would need to apply for a, in addition to an off-premises sales license, correct? In order to even be able to do business with these third parties. And I'm talking primarily with DoorDash, Uber Eats, Grubhub. Right. So uh, an off-premises license would be needed in order to provide that delivery service. 
Uh, and then if a staff person of the licensee wanted to conduct the delivery, then they would get that service permit. But if they wanted to enlist the services of a, a third party, then it would be the individuals who work for uh, Grubhub who would get the service permit. Uh -huh. So uh, the licensee wouldn't need that ser the service permit if its own staff were not doing the deliveries. Oh. And of course, that's just for beer and wine to get it off premises. Right. Absolutely. Yes. So, so, so just a, a full on premises could uh, solicit the uh, a DoorDash to sell wine if it obtained an off premises license it, as it well. Would still, right. Sure. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So let me ask you one very simple question. I'm not putting you on the hook. In your mind, when do you think this is going to be enacted? Uh, in in force, ready to go, collecting revenue. Collecting revenue? Yeah. Our crystal uh, ball our crystal ball burned out this morning, otherwise I'd be all looking at it and tell you. Give us your best. Earliest uh, year and a half. It still has to go through the short session. It depends on what kind of uh, effective date they put on the bill, but we're hoping it's no sooner than one one twenty one because we're gonna have to go to rulemaking to figure stuff out. So that that in itself is a little over a year. But knowing how things work around here, probably a little bit more than that. But that's if the legislature passes it, the rulemaking is done. I'm talking yeah. about actually implementing this thing in effect. But not 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 from a legal point of view, from a, from a from a uh, practical point of view, is that there's going to be delivery. Yeah, yes. I mean, I think once rulemaking is in effect that accommodates this type of arrangement, then I am sure there, I know that there are quite a few businesses in this space who are ready to offer their services to, to businesses. But we're yeah. not ready. Right. Mm -hmm. so, so I would maybe just like emphasize the fun. part about starting small versus in my mind going big going big is our system instead of having 260 agents have their own website and their own delivery system that's going big and that's probably what we're aiming for but in the meantime it's possible maybe it won't happen but it's possible that once if the legislation passes that some of the agents would do this on their own so, for example, they might use a service like Drizzly. Right, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. But how do we keep track of it for, from, a, from a revenue point of view? I don't so that, that won't change. change. Yeah, so it doesn't change. It'll be a bottle sale, sir. Uh, Mr. Mm -hmm. Chairman, Steve Marks, for the record, just so they know who's talking out there. Um, so it'll just be a bottle sale from our store. We'll get the sale at the store. The delivery mm -hmm. service generally charges the cost from there to the deal. So... For us, it's really uh, a couple things. The one piece that I, I think that's important here is it probably preserves our position against beer and wine sales with distilled spirits at the doorstep. Um, that opportunity, you know, OLCC does retail liquor and have agents and set up a system to do that. And right now, beer and wine are getting to the door where uh, not necessarily distilled spirits are being offered there. So this puts us... Gives us that availability. If you're using private third party carriers or other services, this could actually be implemented very quickly after legislation passes uh, by our liquor agents, but it would be very spotty across the state. Yeah. I would say. Okay. So, that, that, so those, those transaction processing uh, services, they, the money flows directly between the consumer and the business into an account designated by the business. So in much the same way that when a person goes into the liquor store today and swipes a credit card, that money goes into an account designated by the store, the same kind of system would be set up using the third parties. Well, I'm, uh, the obvious point, when you have 20,000 potential service permittees, uh, that's tough. Well, in, in so addition to also, also uh, a lot the, of licensees right. are going to, there's going to be an uptick in, in off-premises <clears throat> sales as well, I'd imagine. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty seismic shift. Yeah. It's big. Yeah, we got good money. Mm -hmm. I know they are. It's, it's yeah. what they call a high-class problem. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, sir, we're making some investments, planned investments in IT, so we might be able to figure out how to do that, take advantage of that. That's my spot. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, I good. Mr. Chair, I just yes. have a question. It, it, so, the bill that the House bill that was there before, mm -hmm. um, 
and it, and it died in the last session. Um, they're picking up, which is hopeful, right? That they're they've figured out exactly what the the issues were. Were they? Uh, is there anything of substance as to uh, the the previous issues? The obstruction, yes. I think it was just, uh, you know, the various stakeholder groups had differing perspectives on the latest version and we were kind of coming up against the end of session. And sure. so it just didn't have enough overall support. Um, but I think everybody who was at the table then is at the table now and is in overall interested in seeing the concept move forward. And I'm going to let you off the hook. I'm not going to ask you to prognosticate on, on this <laughs> session, though, so don't worry. I was just curious if it was just something minor or if there was something that really needed some massaging, that's all. So so we've already had one industry meeting, Rick Doherty already had a meeting here and the room was fairly full with industry and there were there was interest and concern and passion, but I don't think the, the effort there was necessarily against it, just sure. more about not understanding it and wanting to make sure it didn't harm their business model. Sure, mm -hmm. understood, thank yeah. you. Yeah, that's, that was a big issue. Yep. Yeah, it was who you're going to hold responsible, how you do yeah, the big sure. carriers versus <laughs> the local Just ones. Just don't take my bills away from me. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. and then enforce it. Understood. Thank you. All right. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Steve, you guys? Yeah, I just a uh, few things. Since Renee's not here to do a legislative report, she's uh, homesick but working, I think, on our behalf today. Um, so we are working. Better? Uh, I hope so. Um, we are uh, we are working on an agent comp uh, proposal with our our retail agents, uh, the co chairs uh, on the Senate side, and uh, the committee really charged us to go out and look at a new proposal. And that uh, Chris Main has put together a, a really um, interesting, um, compelling uh, proposal that would cost a little bit of money to more highly compensate our liquor agents. Um, we presented it to uh, also, which is a organization of a part of our agents. Um, it got a good reception there. Um, we've ob obviously had time to have the chairman uh, preview it with Matt and want to make sure that Chris gets to each one of you and we review that proposal with you. So you can see it. Uh, it's, uh, it's uh, very attractive, so we'll see what happens. It does cost money, but and it may solve some future problems for us. It's pretty innovative in terms of potentially moving the issue of compensation into the unlimited category of the budget. Like when we buy cases of liquor, we buy them. It's not a limited part of our budget, so we have the ability to do that as a cost of business. Um, so if... Uh, if uh, all holds together, it, it may actually uh, provide us a really good way of differentiating compensation by regions, uh, by cost of rent, and by wages. So I'm pretty excited about that proposal, and we should be, but uh, some time coming. But the legislature asked us to report back to February session on uh, agent comp, so there'll be a discussion then about it and a discussion, I think, about the dollars it would take to, to implement that. that As we proposal. discussed, you're going to make sure that all the commissioners get this before yes. the end of the year, right? Yeah, uh, soon. I want to make sure Chris gets to him soon and at least you get the PowerPoints and then we set up some meetings with Chris so he can run you through what the proposal is. We did a, Chris did a webinar with all of the well, it was open to all of the agents across our system. Uh, the participation was about one-fifth of our system um, on that uh, webinar, but we've been reaching out consistently to the agents to get their input about what they want to do. Um, and big way, it really is their proposal, but we're supporting it. And under the direction of the legislature, uh, coming back to them with something for, for the legislature to consider. Um, doing a similar exercise with distillery agent comp um, uh, for the tasting room uh, portions of their facilities. So um, Senator Beyer is very interested in uh, reintroducing that, that issue. He wanted legislation. This may also just become a 
a compensation formula change issue for us on bottle sales to have, subsidize some of the tasting room issues. So that's a, a continuing issue with the legislature. Um, the drawing for products is out. So these are, the, I think the Tuesday. pappies are in Wednesday. there. Next yeah. Week, Wednesday. Yeah. The Wednesday. So we'll have a new drawing for uh, some exclusive uh, products. So uh, get all your friends in. Not, not that you can do it, not that we can participate, but get all our customers to uh, subscribe to that. And we will be introducing a bill, it looks like. We have legislation, and we've been working with the governor's office and others on data commercialization, revenue generation, some suspension of some of the rules of procurement around our business uh, uh, our business issues, not maybe the agency state of Oregon issues, but our particular business issues. Um, so that's uh, proceeding. Um, hope to have um, a draft, uh, hopefully before the end of the year, for us to begin to review and look at. But marching that forward towards the legislature. Um, we might have some tribal issues to clean up in legislation. Uh, if we can make that happen, and we are still working uh, with the particular needs of air carriers and how we service air carriers uh, with um, like TransPAC uh, alcohol for transportation. So it's a little different nature, and we're looking for a way maybe to. Um, uh, we worked on this issue before last session. We got uh, some innovation in in terms of our licensing, but I think we need to do a little innovation around how we service them with pricing because they don't compete. In Oregon, these are air passengers that are being served by that liquor distribution. So, working on some specific issues there. There you go. Right. Um, I, my only uh, comment is that uh, sometime between now and the January fifteenth, I think uh, all the individual commissioners need to be briefed uh, about the, what we're attempting to do in the legislature in February. I think that's Absolutely. really critical yeah. that every one of them. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, one more one more issue that I forgot to mention. So I will be meeting with a number of the wine industry that maybe you met with when we were around the state from different points and uh, working with them so they can advise me and get in that rack appointed. We'll probably appoint that in January time frame um, to see if we can uh, deal with our issue of the... Uh, conjunctive labeling uh, and the legislation we have to deal with here and then um, hopefully keep them talking. I think they are talking, so I think there's a good potential for a good process in place for them to do some work together from upstate, downstate, around state to pull together a strategic plan for, or at least cooperation amongst the, a lot of the industry. So I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful for that, but continue. We're sitting on the porch until they make a decision. <laughs> <laughs> sure, Rosalind. Steve, when's the last time aging compensation all across the board was increased? Hmm? Yeah, this this it's biennium, yeah, increased. a it's bit, about yeah, okay. a little bit. So we've gone up, you know, since my tenure here, we've roughly we've gone from about seven nine to where we are today, a little bit. Thanks.